Hi, everybody. Jason here with AV Pro Edge, and it is Monday. I hope everybody had a great weekend. And that means I am with Anthony Grimani for yet another session on our audio expert series. Anthony, how are you? I am doing great. And yourself, Jason? I'm great, Anthony. I hope you had a nice weekend. I did. I did. Thank you. Good, bike, good. Bike riding, hanging out, having a good time. That's Wonderful. excellent. Yeah, we got out a little bit on Saturday, and then yesterday was actually kind of gross and cloudy, so we didn't really do too much. But, you know, it's okay. Summer's here. That's how it is in Florida. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, today is going to be a, a really cool session, and we only have three left, including this one. Um, and today we're going to talk a lot about acoustics, just general room acoustics, um, things that are going to stop you from having a nice sound system when you probably have nice components. Uh, so we wanted to cover some simple room acoustic type things and give you guys some tips on how to avoid things that will make the system sound bad. Does that sound like a pretty good description? <laughs> that That sounds about right. Cool, cool. Very good. So, uh, Anthony, without further ado, if you want to uh, introduce yourself to everybody, um, I do have the question box open here, guys. So as we go through the presentation today, feel free to type those questions in, and uh, we'll field those throughout the presentation. And if we have some time at the end, we'll, we'll have some questions at the end, too, as well. Sounds great. Fantastic. So um, those of you who have been watching these webinars, uh, I, I can see in the list that there's some repeat offenders. Thank you very much. Uh, you notice that I, I never fail to bring in the issue of rooms, room acoustics, how do they influence a speaker, how do they influence a sense of loudness, everything. Um, and that's just repeatedly because when we're in a home cinema or when we're listening to, to, to speakers in a listening room, there's sound coming from the speakers and then there's sound bouncing around the room and there's what the room is also adding to that as what you could call distortions. Um, and so I, I always bring it up. And uh, I've, I've already talked quite a bit uh, in, in various sessions about what happens inside the room and how you control it through absorbers, diffusers, and all the stuff that's in our, in our listening room behind here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but today I'm, I'm actually going to spend a fair amount of focus on other parts of room acoustics and parts that people don't always pay attention to and don't, don't, don't realize uh, the influence, um, how much influence that has on the sound system. So. Um, I'm, this is Acoustics 101, mm -hmm. which uh, people in the U.S. know what that means. That's like the first class, freshman year of first level, yeah, whether it's high school or college, first level. Uh, in other countries, that for you know, for viewers from other countries, that just means it's the first level, the introductory class. Um, and so, what I'm going to do here is is do an overview of all of the things that matter in acoustics for home cinema, not acoustics for airports. Okay, I'm I'm leaving that out of our conversation. It's just about home cinema. Um, and of course, in an hour, you're just going to get an overview, and there's no way you can learn all about acoustics. It, you know, it would take about 10 years, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more than glad to sit here for 10 years and do this. But um, <laughs> I'll, t I'll take a break for uh, more water at some point. So in our in the course, we're going to talk about sound isolation, um, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on that. I'm I'm mm -hmm. very uh, I'm very interested in that. I I think it's an important thing to pay attention to. It's often forgotten in mm -hmm. good home cinema designs. Uh, I'm going to talk about control of background noise. I'm going to talk a little bit about standing waves, not that much because I've already talked about it a lot yeah. in other sessions. And then I'm going to talk somewhat about uh, reflection control, which is what you know, what, what bounces around the room and what do you use all these absorbers, diffusers, and all this stuff for. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I have three uh, three companies that operate under the roof of this building. One is Grimani Systems that designs and builds really high quality and very novel loudspeakers, kind mm -hmm. of a new way to look at how uh, uh, how speakers primarily for integration applications are built. I have a company called a PMI Engineering that's now 21 years old that designs and engineers home cinemas, listening rooms, control rooms, studios, all kinds of different things. And the Dimension 4 Acoustics that makes and sells acoustical materials for listening rooms. All kinds of different applications. Uh, I have a degree in electrical engineering. It's called a BSEE, -E. um, <laughs> and I'll try not to BS too much. Uh, I spent. I was lucky enough, right out of my BS degree, to spend five years working at Dolby in the very, very early, early days of surround sound. So mm. got exposed right in the beginning to what became the foundation of what's home theaters today. Uh, then I was lucky enough to spend ten years at Lucasfilm THX, and boy, that was fun. 
Um, 21 years ago, I started my own company, uh, mm -hmm. AMI Engineering, and that's a lot of freedom. And like I always joke, the freedom to have fun and freedom to work, endless hours for oh, anybody yeah. who's a company <laughs> owner, you know exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so all told, I can say I've had 36 years of fun. Actually, fun started before that, but in, in the professional side of things, 36 years of having a good time, and I hope to have a few more to go. Yeah, we talked um, uh, we talked last week about how you and I both got a really early start, just like with our dads hanging out in the you know in the stereo right. shop checking stuff out at a young age. That, that was really cool to hear that background. That was very fun. Yeah. I, I still have. If any of you guys actually visit me over here, there's an entire little museum of, of old audio gear. That's cool. Uh, probably half of it actually came from my dad, some beautiful old Thorns turntables. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, just some, some, some gorgeous stuff um, and a lot of stuff he built. Uh, so mm -hmm. he was from an era where you built your own stuff. Sure. And he was an electrical engineer, so he built his own stuff. He taught this stuff at university. And, um, and so uh, I still have a few projects of his that I have to finish. I, maybe That's I'll wait cool. to retire to to finish those out. That's really cool. Um, for those of you who are actually into tube amps, I, tube amps and preamps have benefits and disadvantages. Biggest disadvantage is that the output impedance is just way too high sure. to drive a modern loudspeaker, typically an ohm or two. He had a design uh, for a triad output uh, uh, tube amp with an output impedance of about 0.1 ohms, which mm -hmm. is not as low as a transistor amp, but low enough to be able to drive a, a modern speaker correctly. Sure. And you know, one of these days, maybe I'll finish building that up. And, <laughs> yeah. and if any of you guys out there like listening want to help with that, we can play with that. So there you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I made the top 50 list of custom retailer, top 20 of C Pro Magazine. I've won many CD awards. Uh, I've made top CD instructor. I invented Surround EX somewhere along the way. <laughs> I'm a CDO fe fellow, member of AES, have patents, have kids, uh, play the guitar and saxophone. I have an airplane, some old cars, many bicycles. Uh, and I generally try to uh, work hard and play hard. Oh yeah, definitely. So uh, without, like you said, without further ado, let's just jump right into the sound isolation. Sure. Uh, so quick check, uh, Jason, you can hear me, yes? Yeah, I can hear you, I can see you. I, I don't know if you're meaning to share your screen quite yet, but I don't see your screen. I am meaning to share my screen, of course. And all of this time it was sharing and I, I am reminded that there's always something you and I need to yeah, do. That's okay. To make that happen, like you have to make me present. Oh, so I'm, that's I'm right. Yeah, let's do that real quick. Sorry about that, guys. Give me Not just a moment. Just reminding. And, oh, sure, sure, sure. I have to make you the presenter. And... Presenterator. Boom. There you go. Show my screen. Excellent. Okay, do you see it now? Excellent. There it is. Okay, hey, cool. So, la 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 la. If I so, hit Anthony, while, while you're queuing that up, um, I just want to uh, just an observation here. You know, we talk so much about video about making the room dark to eliminate reflections and, and and polluting the image. With audio, it's really the same, right? Like eliminating background noises and doors that rattle and air conditioners and making the room quiet, just like we want to make the room dark. That's fair to say, yes. Uh, you know, that's a that's a great analogy to to say that we want to make the room dark acoustically. Um, yeah, right. That's interesting. <laughs> There's one difference. There's one difference, and maybe it's the same as in video. Uh, a room that's totally black is ideal for some of parts of it, but also a mm -hmm. room with a a gray bias yes. is also good, and a gray bias yes. for your eyes. So mm -hmm. I would say acoustically, it's about the same. You don't want a room. You don't want the room to be completely black. The ideal right. room is one in which You've controlled the light and you've got a neutral gray bias around the screen yeah. so that your your eyes, your uh, just like in video, your eyes have something to reference to and in audio, right. your, your ears have something to reference to, without which things just seem a little funky. Sure. So, um, okay, now you can see this, right? Yep, we're good to go. So let's start with sound isolation. Why do we worry about sound isolation? Man, I have to defend this all the time, all the time, all the time with architects and builders, and it just drives me nuts. Well, look, the the average level inside a home cinema during an action scene is gonna be 100 to 110 dB of sound pressure level with peaks at 120 or 125. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, outside the home cinema, we may wanna hear peacefulness, which is a, a noise that's below 40 dB. So what's outside the cinema? If the if outside the cinema is a kitchen, uh, if it's a bedroom, um, if it's another game room, you, you don't want to be blasting the people next door. So sure. in very rough terms, if we want 100 dB on average inside the cinema during loud scenes and we want 40 outside, you do the math, that's a difference of 60. Mm -hmm. And that's expressed as a sound transmission class. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. 
Uh, but it pretty much means that the sound is attenuated by about 60 dB. That's 100 minus 40. Now, by the same token, as you don't want to blast everybody around the house, um, or if it's not a house, the studio, whatever it is, you also don't want noise from the outside coming into the cinema. And that noise from the outside should result in a background noise inside the, the room of less than 25 dB. Some of the noise is transient, comes and goes, some of it's consistent. We'll talk about that. But ideally, you want a room that's essentially in a an isolated acoustic bubble um, inside the, the building structure that doesn't blast sound out and doesn't let any sound in so that in mm -hmm. the end you have what I call total sound comfort. That's cool. I like that. Registered trademark, should, believe it or not. Pad, yeah. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I, I have the registration on that. Oh, cool. Um, That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and like I say, that in five bucks will buy me a coffee at the local coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is my simple little science for the masses that I have to show architects and designers why we worry mm. about this. So here on one side is is the sound source, shown here as a speaker with a big horn. On the other side is a person sitting meditating, looking at the wall, wearing mm -hmm. a red hat and red socks. Um, and that speaker is going to blast sound into the wall, and some of the sound is going to bounce, is going to re-radiate through the wall, and some of it's going to radiate through gaps and cracks at the top and bottom. And our meditator is going to have a big frown on their face. You look at the animation. I like, Turn I like, I like the, I like that touch. I like the touch of the frown. That was good. And then I should have been an animator, not. Um, so what we, what we're looking for is generally an environment that has no leaks, whether they're physical mm -hmm. transfer leaks through the wall structures or gaps and holes uh, all over. We just want the sound to stay so that the, the person next door has good privacy, big smile on their face, right? There you go. So there are um, some benefits uh, to good sound isolation is that, that you can use the room anytime. So mm -hmm. if you're, you know, there, there are some, some, I'm actually amazed how many people uh, out there have insomnia. It's, it's uh, remarkable. When I start talking about that, it's like, oh, man, it's like, well, you know, maybe you want to get up and go watch something on TV, whether it's mm -hmm. a movie, a documentary, whatever. You want to be able to do that any time of the day without bothering anybody else in the house. Um, so at the same time, you don't want any interference from the outside, so you don't lose any of the sound subtlety. And so overall, it's a good thing to do. Uh, now, in the strategies of sound isolation, I'm going to uh, describe three main ways to get sound oh, yeah. isolation. Um, one strategy is is what I call mass. Give me a quick second here. I know yeah, go right ahead. My voice is coming out of this confidence telephone over here. Oh, gotcha. And okay. Uh, so one is one is mass, which is to you know, make the walls really uh, heavy, and I'm going right. to call that ineffective. It works, but it's not super effective. The other one is damping, which mm -hmm. is to stop the free resonance and vibration of structures, that's effective. And then there's decoupling, which is to separate structures so that they're holding together, but they're actually either rubber, you know, shock mounted with, with uh, rubber couplers or spring couplers. And that's mm -hmm. extremely effective. That works That works really good in proper English. So um, I mentioned STC earlier. Um, sound transmission class is uh, a, a number is a description used in architecture and acoustics to describe how much sound goes through. And I will, I will mention it doesn't tell you everything, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So um, sound transmission class is, a, is kind of an averaged measurement when you look at tr the transmission loss in, uh, in third octave bands between two structures. So let's say you have uh, our speaker on one side that you know I was showing before and the, mm -hmm. the meditating listener on the other side how much sound is going through at different frequencies can actually be measured and plotted as a transmission loss. And so let's say you had a structure in, in which around the mid frequency, the, um, the sound loss is, let's say here, Chase 52 dB, 53 dB, 55, uh, or 54, 55, and it goes up with frequency, which is relatively common. The higher frequencies are more easily blocked. Mm -hmm. And then as you can see on the low frequencies, it's harder and harder to control. So this this would be the actual sound isolation of a pretty decent wall. Um, and that wall, uh, if you want to define it instead of a bunch of different bands, if you want to mm -hmm. define it as one number, you do a curve fitting, which is you put this curve that more or less fits in here and in which there's least a maximum amount of decibels of deviation from that curve. So the STC curve is not one that's pass fail. It's one where you look at all of this, you average it out, and you go, "Well, mm -hmm. I'm doing I'm doing better than uh, I'm doing 
better than this curve here, worse than this curve by so many dB, and there's this whole complicated uh, number, and a sound isolation structure, which this would be actually kind of like a wall, this is interesting, this would be like a two by four wall mm -hmm. with this thing called quiet rock on one side, would kind of get to something like this. Note that at low frequency, it doesn't work as well as the mids and highs, and that would all curve fit into what's called an STC55. I realize this is a little hard to see, the resolution isn't great here, but that would, that would have a number in which the perceived sound loss between one side and the other is 55 dB, the perceived. Now, notice there's a tolerance on the low frequency where mm -hmm. you actually need a whole lot less transmission loss to, to make that grade. And that's because the human hearing, hearing is a lot less sensitive at low frequency than it is at uh, mids and highs. So you can actually tolerate a lot more noise or unwanted mm -hmm. signal and still have a perception that things aren't that bad. Um, the other thing I want you to notice, really, really important, really important, and I, I, I have to often argue this with architects that are looking at a book and go, oh, this thing, this wall structure has STC 60, it'll be great. Notice that the STC curve stops at 125 hertz. Um, I hope you guys that are watching know that 125 hertz is not the bottom base. Right. 125 hertz, I think, in, in audio, we'd sort of call that middle base. Mm -hmm. and, and 125 hertz is actually kind of the main chest resonance of a, of a mid-sized man. Uh, so when you talk, there's like three different sounds. There's the chest that's going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's the throat that's going, ah, and then there's a mouth that's interrupting all that going. Um, should have been a vocalist. Um, have, you, have you ever considered uh, freestyle rapping with that one? That's good. Yeah, right. <laughs> or beatboxing uh, maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so note that anything below a men's voice is not described in the STC curve. So when a tank crashes into a wall and goes kablam, mm -hmm. uh, none of that is, the, the effects of that on the neighboring spaces is not described by STC. Um, also note, oh, also note, and less important that above uh, eight kilohertz, there's no description. We won't have to worry about that so much, but this is a real big issue because you can have two different wall structures with the same STC value and one, one has really good base control and the other one doesn't. So when you're working with architects, designers, homeowners, people that are just looking at books and going, yeah, I'm going to use this wall because it has a really high STC. Mm -hmm. Note that in most cases, you can also look at the individual bands uh, of any wall structure and you can see whether it's also working well at low frequency. All right. Uh, the way a wall is actually described in STC, so, so I'm, I'm talking about a wall in the description is there are these reference books uh, out there you can get and you can look at that, um, that actually show the effects of different wall structures. Um, they're, they're in textbooks. You can also get uh, you know, lots of downloads from the internet that show, mm -hmm. hey, a, a wall with this kind of sheetrock, that kind of stud, that kind of sheetrock, maybe this amendment, this gizmo, this thing made by this specialty manufacturer is going to have this result. And the way that's yeah. done is that wall, ideally, that if you see that data, that means that wall was actually sent to, um, or those materials were sent to a, a test laboratory. And there's, I mean, I don't exactly know. Let's say that there's 10 good lab laboratories in the US and there's another mm -hmm. good 20 or 30 around the world that mm -hmm. can test this. Um, that wall partition is put in the middle of a big, big space. Uh, lo loudspeakers are playing really, really loud sound on one side, and microphones are placed on the other side to see what's what's left of that. And mm -hmm. that's how it's measured. All the data is uh, carefully analyzed, and you get an STC grade for that. And usually, if you get a real report, you'll see a page or two, sometimes some pictures that show how the thing was built, how it was mm -hmm. tested and stuff. You'll also notice that if you look at three or four STC measurements of the same wall structure from different labs, they can be a little different. So, uh, and that's because there's a lot of experimental error at that process, but generally they, they tend in the same direction. So, um, this is, you'll have to forgive me, I, f I forget where I got this from now, but this is actually a, a, a great diagram that shows a bunch of STC values for different wall partitions. On the top is solid walls, on the bottom, uh, solid walls being masonry, so uh, brick, concrete, um, things that are that are non-porous, you know, heavy materials. On the bottom is uh, frame construction, sometimes known as balloon construction, stuff that's very typical of the USA, 
uh, for lots of cultural reasons over here, but is actually starting to spread internationally quite a bit, um, mainly because it's it's a cheaper way to build, but it's also a, a way to build with better thermal isolation than big solid concrete. Um, there's a lot of countries where the feeling is still that um, you know you 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 want you really want to build out of solid materials and it's going to last a long time. And yeah, that's that's how in Europe you have buildings that are 400 years old, but thermally they're a little bit of an issue. Anyway, uh, what's also in here that's really cool is a surface density of these different wall structures showing mass. So let's go, let's go right here. So this is a this is a wall with a surface density. Oh no, actually, stop. Let's go back. Let, let's go to a standard basic interior wall of construction, which is a stud with sheetrock on either sides. Mm -hmm. So this would be a, a wood a wood beam. Uh, I I'm conscious of the fact that there's international listeners and they may not know what a stud is other than you, sure, Jason. Man. You're a stud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> wood or sometimes metal uh, section with a gypsum board on one side and the other. That's the generic term. Everybody calls it drywall or sheetrock, which right. are registered trademarks, by the way, of the companies who make those. But gypsum board uh, that has a sound a sound transmission class of somewhere between 35 and 40. That means mm -hmm. that in the middle frequencies, it blocks about uh, 40 decibels of the sound. At the low frequencies, it may be less. At the high frequencies, it may be less. Note mm -hmm. that the surface density of this assembly is between six and 12 pounds per square foot. Um, those of you listening outside the country, do the translation. I should have done that in meters, in uh, kilograms per square meter. But um, note that the same partition, which I'm not defining here in thickness, but it's probably about this much thickness of concrete, mm -hmm. has a surface density of between 8 and 16, a lot heavier, a lot, lot more mass to get the same sound isolation. Now, Note what happens once you put insulation in here. So first thing I always run into, oh yeah, we're building a theater here, Mr. You know, Grabani theater designer. We've insulated the walls. We're, we're putting a bunch of uh, fiberglass right. in there. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Great. Now it's going to be thermally insulated, but check it out. What did we gain? We gained ourselves three decibels yeah. of sound isolation. Only three. Three. Not much. Spanish, that's tres. In yes. French, it's trois. In German, it's drei. It, that's not enough, and I'll right. explain why that's why that's happening now. Does, Anthony, real quick, does that does that depend on the material? Because I know uh, at least here in Florida, we we do have a lot of buildings that are um, the insulation is spray foam versus you know the the pink stuff that we always call it the fiberglass stuff. Does the yeah. material matter in this, or is it or is it about the same? The material does matter, and actually, if you do the spray stuff, uh, either Isonine as a brand or one of one of those, you're going to see one decibel of improvement. So oh, really, so not it's, it's useful. Less even. Yeah, uh, less even. Uh, note note that you've increased the density of this to you know average of between seven and thirteen pounds per square foot. The equivalent would be twelve to twenty five in mass. Right. I'm going to make my point that mass is not the right place to start, but I'm I, this is a great chart. Now, mm -hmm. let's add two layers of sheetrock on either side, and that's the other mm -hmm. thing. Uh, uh, these lines represent one layer, a second layer of gypsum board, a layer, a second layer. I bump into this all the time. It's like, oh, we're building a theater. We've insulated the walls. We've done two layers of sheetrock. Okay, well, what are we gaining from that? Compared to the regular construction, we gained ourselves 5 dB. So kind of kind of a bit useful, but it's only yeah. 5 dB. Right. That means that when the scene is blastic on one side of the wall uh, at 100 dB, instead of getting so a regular wall would turn it down 40. Right. So 100 minus 40 is 60. Instead mm -hmm. of getting 60, you're getting 55. Is the yeah. person sleeping next door still uh, sleeping? No. Probably not, yeah. So that's not helping. And by the way, the surface density has now gone to an average between 12, 12 and 24, call it 20. To get the same isolation, you'd, get, you'd need 25 pounds out of solid material. Let's keep going. So now, Oh, okay, we're going to do better. We, we're going to do the two layers of sheetrock. We're going to put some some insulation in there. That'll work great. Okay, so now we've gotten up to 48 dB, AP, dB, dB improvement, or 48 dB, which is an 8 decibels of improvement. Okay, well, mm -hmm. so now it's 8 dB better. That's starting to be a little now significant. Starting, yeah, That's yeah. like taking the volume control and turning it down this much. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we've gone up to an average of maybe 22 pounds per square foot uh, for the this type of construction instead of 30 pounds. Still, yeah. you know, still the gypsum, you know, the, the the sort of soft construction is better. Okay. Now let's go to the other way to build these walls, which is instead of uh, everything being solidly anchored together, you start to decouple it, which is you do. Uh, separated studs. That, that what we're seeing here is staggered stud with studs where the studs kind of are offset, and I'll show you a diagram later how to do that. Um, this is back to a mass density of between six and twelve, which is the mm -hmm. same as over here. Um, and check out what we do for That's... much less weight. Yeah. Right. For half the mass, we got the same sound isolation. And half the mass also means half the materials, which also means probably half the budget. For the building a lot materials. Less budget, lot, lot less yeah. material. And by the way, if you're building a high rise, if you're building a building, you know, that's six, eight, twelve stories tall, um, this is a lot less mass on the foundation of the building than doing this. And yet yeah, I point. see this being done way too little. Um good point. anyway, let's keep going. So now we take this wall, which is uninsulated, there's nothing going on inside it. Um, and I will mention because I know that coming up there's not there's not a lot about this because there's not a lot of time. But when you have an open cavity like this, there is a resonant frequency. Yep. I hope you hear what happens when I do this around my mouth. Absolutely. Other than it getting loud into the, in the microphone, <laughs> there's frequencies that resonate, and those resonant frequencies mean that the sound's transferring really well at that resonance frequency, and that gets in the way of getting a good grade on the STC curve. So if you look at the chart that was before, there'd probably be a few frequencies in which the transmission loss is down, which is the sounds going through, and, mm -hmm. and you are bumped down maybe 5 dB in the curve. Now, let's put some insulation in there. Let's actually put some pink green blue i don't really care but something that's usually thermal insulation that's kind of fuzzy and that damps the resonances inside the wall but look at what happens wink so we go from 48 to 51 so now we gain yep. 3 db by just adding some stuff in there mm -hmm. now what gets interesting is here at between 7 and 13 let's call it 10 pounds per square foot of mass for the system we we would have to build a wall structure that's 50 pounds Per square foot out of solid mm -hmm. materials to get the same rating doesn't that seem counterintuitive completely it does to me just going over it right now with you i mean it seems like a big heavy concrete wall would would do much better but it's totally yeah. backwards it's backwards so a lot of a lot of things in life like that are are counterintuitive um, right and the when i explain in a few slides you'll go i get it oh that's why uh, yeah spoiler alert if it's solid, the sound that hits one surface transmits through the surface and goes goes out. <clears throat> and you need to get to really heavy walls for that sound not to transfer with the loud bass and loud energy in a theater. Uh, case in point, uh, if any of you guys are, live in places where there's concrete construction in a, in a building, let's say imagine you're in a high-rise building, 10, 10 stories tall. One person with a percussion drill trying to drill a hole, you know, it goes, yeah, you yeah. can hear it through the whole building. That's true, yeah. And that's all concrete, heavy, heavy structure, but man, mm -hmm. it goes right through. Sure. Um, I know because I've built in spaces like that and lives in spaces like that. It's unbelievable. One person wants to hang, you know, something on Saturday morning and everybody's <laughs> yeah. like, Boop, what's going on? <laughs> what's happening? Um, yeah. All right. Let's keep going because I, I, I find this chart really interesting in seeing the progression sure. of, of how oh, yeah. things work. So now we go to the next structure, which is we take the insulation back out. We do two layers of sheetrock. Uh, which is back to the same mass density as the one over here. Right. Uh, so let's see an average of 20. And look at that. We we jump now we jump up to 53. Uh, and so compared to what we had before. So the 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 mass addition between here and here. And uh, Jason, can you confirm that you're actually seeing my mouse bouncing yep. around here? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. You got it. Uh, by the way, video is uninterrupted. Audio is all good. We're yeah, so we're great so far. Fantastic. Okay, so so viewership, my my audience, different computer today. Finally, it's like after all scratching our heads, like why is this thing interrupted all the time? It's like maybe it's my computer. So yeah. we'll we'll see. If, now that I've said that, I'm going to be jinxed. Yeah, you jinxed like, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we're adding mass. Uh, mm -hmm. Before, when we added mass, we got ourselves a whole improvement of five dB. Let's see what happens over here. We're going from here to here. And we're going from 48 to 53. That's another mm -hmm. 5 dB, right? And then um, we take that mass and we add insulation. And now we're up at, so 
two layers sheetrock, two layers sheetrock mm -hmm. on staggered studs, and we get ourselves a um, an insulation of up to 5060B, uh, an STC of 56, which in order to match that in concrete would be, let's say, somewhere around 100 pounds per square foot, which is starting mm -hmm. to be a pretty thick concrete wall. Um, now, granted, this is pretty thick. So this is, you know, two by four stud, about, right. you know, 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter, uh two by four two by four mm -hmm. and so the whole wall structure is getting close to around seven inches but it's lightweight right right so it's not very heavy materials mm -hmm. it's not very hard to build um so now we're getting to 56 this is starting to be a, a place where when you're playing sound in the theater on one side the the space next door has reasonable uh, calm and mm -hmm. you're you've got privacy between the spaces Let's keep going. Next wall construction is instead of having the studs offset on the same plate, let's actually build dual plates. So there's one, one wall, a second wall, there's a little bit of a gap, and let's start all over again. No insulation, a bit of insulation, double layers, a bit of insulation. So with no insulation, just doing this gets us up to 51. Mm -hmm. So note it, note not a whole lot better grade than this. However, if you could actually look at the low frequency response of this wall versus that, it would probably be about 15 dB different because there's a much bigger gap between here and here. So um, I mentioned the STC uh, scale stops at 125. Uh, let's see, right. pointing in your direction, that would be uh, let's see. That way. That way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that way. Yeah. Um, but when you look at 60, which is important, or 50, yeah. you, you need to compare these wall structures and not just rely on the SDC number. So if you looked at that, you'd see this wall behaves better. Mm -hmm. But let's add some insulation. We get our 3 dB back. Let's do dual layers. We get another 3 dB. Mm -hmm. And let's do two layers, two layers, and a bit of insulation. And bam, we've got up to our, our target value of around STC 60. Yeah. Um, Anthony, is this, I know we're talking a lot about um, uh, kind of not annoying the people in the rooms around us. Is this doing anything for the room we're sitting in? And the reason I ask that is because I'm thinking back to my old, old, old days of car audio, and we would do SPL contests, and we would have people pile onto the car to stop it from flexing so the measurement inside the car was better. Is yeah. this helping the room that we're sitting in, or is this just to not annoy the people around us? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, for inside the room, it has a few benefits. W one of them is if there's a house around you, there's movement mm -hmm. around the house, and whether it's audible consciously or unconsciously, all of that noise is getting in the way of you're enjoying the movie or mm -hmm. hearing all of the subtleties in the, in the soundtrack or in music, by the way. Right. I know we're here to talk about home cinema. I'm, I'm a music lover. You're also a music lover. I've mm -hmm. noticed, you know, noticed the guitar behind you. Oh, yeah. you know, it, it, there's elements in music, the reverb tales, the little subtle things in like, you know, you move your fingers on a guitar and there's like that little yep. of, of the fingers that moving. Slide sound, yes. Yep. Right, that that can get totally lost if there's mm -hmm. background noise coming into the room. So um, either overall background noise in the home that comes from refrigeration, ventilation, noise outside, whether there's a freeway mm -hmm. nearby, right? Uh, if you're close to an airplane to, to an airport, all of that ambient noise coming into the room gets in the way of the noise floor of the room, which gets in the way of hearing all the quality in your speakers. You know, the the biggest difference between a really high quality amplifier and a low quality amplifier these days is in the noise floor. Mm -hmm. I know people talk about all this stuff of transparency and all this stuff, but you know, seriously, uh, it costs a lot of money to drop 10 or 15 or 20 dB of noise floor in the electronics of, of a product. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost that much money to get level or distortion these days. Noise floor is still really expensive. And if your room is noisy, you're not going to hear the difference between an expensive amp and a cheap amp. That's interesting. Um, it it sounds a lot like black level on a TV. To be honest with you, that's the exactly. hardest part. <laughs> it's the hardest, part, it's the hardest it, yeah. part. And if the room is bright or has bright colors or light walls, right. there's no point in getting an expensive right. TV or projector. So it's it's about the same. I'm going to talk about that in noise control coming up. Cool. All that's right. Interesting. So this is sort of a a, a quick display of different wall structures, uh, mm -hmm. how you can build them, what the progression is, and what the value of different wall constructions, especially those that are decoupled, what they have over just adding mass. So let's look at how this happens. First of all, let's look at how the sound transfers in a regular wall structure. So uh, on the left of your, your picture over here, is a standard construction in the USA and increasingly in the world, which is uh, gypsum board, gypsum board, a 
wood part, a wood structure in the middle, a frame structure with studs um, and cross blocking that holds them all together. In this case, I've actually shown a wall with some insulation in it, but um, sound hits the wall on one side, it vibrates the plate of the wall, that vibration transmits, some of it transmits through the stud, some of it transmits through the air gap between them, and the stud vibrates the wall on the other side, which re-radiates out, it's that simple. The, the, the air pushes the stud, it transmits mm -hmm. through the vibration, and then back up, okay? And if you want to ever hear that, just go rap on, on a... Yeah. Um, just knock on, on a wall. wall with either your knuckles or a little piece of wood, a little hammer, mm -hmm. and you'll actually hear on, on the backside just how noisy it is. One of my favorite things to do is to bring along a little music box that I've torn apart that usually oh, yeah. plays happy birthday Sure. because um, people recognize that. And I'll <laughs> put that on a wall on one side and have people he listen on that side. Then I'll go, 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 go back to the other side of this regular mm -hmm. construction and listen to how you hear this almost as much because yeah. it's going right through the studs. That's so, a simple little test. That's cool. I like that. T totally cool. People are like, wow, it's my Whoa, birthday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Rebuild the wall. Um, yeah. So really important, really, really important thing I want to say is most of the transmission here is through the solid connection. And so whether it's just a stud made of wood or concrete, whatever it is, as long as it's solidly connecting, it goes right through. And you have to add a ton of mass for it to ha to go less through. And let, let me show you. So if you build a wall made out of seven layers of gypsum board, uh, you know, half inch or five eighths, five eighths would work better, uh, which is, uh, you know, about 12 millimeters on one side and seven layers on the other side. So you've gone from two layers to 14. Mm. There's still a transmission solid, but now there's enough mass that the STC has gone from 40 to 55. Right. So you've gained 15 decibels of sound isolation by adding uh, 12 layers of sheetrock to the original construction. But 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 what happens to the budget of the build at that point? I mean, yeah, you gain this this <laughs> this less sound for the other. But man, now your walls are this thick and your budget's out of control. So a bunch of things go wrong with this. One of them is budget. The other one too is load bearing. I mean, if this yeah. is a room that's actually sitting on top of a basement wall or something, now you've like not added good. all of that layer. And what about mm -hmm. space? You've just lost all of the space. Uh, not good. There's another right. thing actually that goes wrong from doing this is now the walls are stiff enough that the standing waves are completely stuck inside the room. They have nowhere oh, to display. Wow. Bottom line is don't be doing this. Yeah, do not do, do this. No, yeah. yet. Pa possible. <laughs> no lo hagan. All right. Um, so there's a bunch of strategies. So strategy one, add mass, not good. And I hope, mm -hmm. I hope that by now you guys have forgotten that. Strat strategy two. By the way, I'm spending a lot of time on this sound ISO thing because it is important. Oh, it's yeah. often forgotten, but it's really important. So strategy two, remember our standard wall transmits through uh, by by vi vibrating the first plate, transmitting through vibrating the other plate. Well, if you use some type of damping material, uh, and there's a bunch of different choices, all most of which are called viscoelastic polymers. Mm -hmm. um, there's one brand that I'm citing here called Green Glue, which is the one that's kind of gotten itself the uh, the best marketed, um, actually starting to be around the world. Yeah, um, the guys it. who developed that are really cool. It's a, it's a good product. Uh, to be fair, there's other products too that are damping materials, uh, but that's the best known. So if you do two layers of sheetrock that are squeezing green glue in the middle mm -hmm. and then a stud and then two layers of sheetrock that are squeezing that in the other, on the other side, you, you still get re-radiation, but because the plates are not so free to, to ring around like a symbol mm -hmm. on, right. a, on, a, on a drum kit, you get a lot less sound transferring and the STC in the end is somewhere between 52 and 55, depending on what you're looking at. It, uh, would, would, a simple, would a simple way to look at this would it be safe to say if it's vibrating, it's making sound? So we got to stop yeah. the we got to stop it from vibrating, yeah. right? You got to just stop the vibration. There's yeah. a great demo I think from from those guys, uh, which is that they have a symbol. You know, I've seen this at a trade show. You have a symbol, regular one. You hit it, goes. Oh, then sure. you paint some green glue underneath and just go. And got that's, it. No, it almost almost sounds like Dynamat, what we used to use in cars. Yep. Yeah, it has a, it's the same application as dynamics except that the the theory of use is or the process of use is a little different sure. it's called a constrained layer process in which mm -hmm. when the plates move i'm trying to do this so it's a little modern dance ballet on my hands yeah the other one has to flex more than the other one uh, to, to work and in the middle to for that to happen this green material 
it's only green because they put a dye in it. But the material inside uh, has to get squeezed and expanded and squeezed and expanded. And the molecular structure in there, actually through friction of the the, the structure, creates heat. And right. that heat dissipates the vibration into thermal energy. Um, so that that's how that's done, actually. Dynamats, kind of a, it's a bituminous material. It's not done by constrained layer. It's done by just, just adding soft mass, right. limp right. mass, known in the industry. Um, and uh, this stuff works really well. And it's in from a construction budget, it's pretty straightforward. You you put the first layer up, and then I, I like to actually paint the green glue on the back of the next layer, put it up, go. Awesome. But, 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 um, it doesn't do very much at low frequencies. Ah, there's the catch. There's the catch. And the reason it doesn't do very much at low frequency is simply that it, the low frequencies are just going to re radiate through the wall. The whole wall moves together. It does it. something, but, uh, but, if you got a lot of subwoofers and you got a person next door who's sensitive to subwoofers and it in a room where by Murphy's law, right where they put their head, there's a huge bump at 50 hertz because of standing waves, you got a problem. Yeah. And believe me, I've worked on a room. Oh, I'm sure you've seen it a ton of times. So another way to do damping, by the way, I'm not calling it dampening. Dampening is the act of putting water on something. This is called damping. Good point. Uh, is, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> is a material called quiet rock. They're sort of the, the initiators of that in the industry. Uh, there's now four other brands that do this same kind of thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, often known as sound engineered drywall. Um, so same kind of concept is is instead of putting sheetrock, you, you buy – this sheetrock that's internally layered with this damping uh, material, there's a bunch of different thicknesses and different ways that they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same concept, which is it damps the vibration. And what you get is an STC of a more or less 50, 51, 52, depending on the construction. Is, but is that stuff a lot more cost? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Ah, um, you know, what's interesting is the sheet, uh, quiet rock is a lot more expensive than regular sheetrock, but you only have to put up one layer. Uh, oh, okay. And so I'm, you know, I, I'm not the guy doing yeah. the building. I've analyzed that it's about the same price. Uh, you know, whether you have to do two layers that you're painting together or one layer of quiet rock. Sometimes it's easier to get one material. Sometimes easier to get the other material. Um, I'll, I'll say no more. I think it's it ends up being about the same. Cool. Okay. Good. Um, I, uh, certainly the added layer with quiet rock is easier if there's a – excuse me, the added layer with green glue is easier if there's if somebody's already built the partitions and the client's going, well, look, there's a lot of sound going through. What do I do? It's like, mm -hmm. well, let's just throw up one more layer yeah. of, of sheet rock with green glue on one side and on the other side. And, uh, that's hope a great solution. Back. That that if, if anybody's listening, that's actually a, a great point. What if the wall's already built? Well, as Anthony just said, slap some green glue on it, another layer. Yeah. If you can actually put some – some insulation inside that helps further, which means either having a peel back one layer or, you know, poke some holes at the top of the bays and drop insulation in there. Sure. If there's cross blocking, you have to poke two holes and then and then uh, patch them up. OK, so let's look at a different strategy instead of mass. You know, remember in my little summary, I said you can add mass, which don't work so good right. uh, or does not work very well. Uh, you can do damp damping materials, which works pretty well for the money. Uh, or uh, my favorite is to do some decoupling. The old venerable system out there was called the RC1 um, resilient channel. It it works. It's a big metal strip that's actually kind of built a zig zigzag. You screw it into the, sheet, the, the studs and then you hang the sheetrock in front of it. Sometimes you put a piece of what's known as soundboard, which is a low density material that in itself does nothing to block sound. It just damps the, the, the piece of sheetrock from vibrating. Hmm. Um, that works. You get better insulation. However, however, warning, big, huge warning. It's hard to get right. It's easy to mess up. And the way it gets messed up is if somebody drives a screw right here mm -hmm. that's long enough, right through the whole assembly, they're going to screw the sheetrock right back to the stud. And I've oh. seen it over and over and over again. The wall doesn't work. Everybody's put yeah. a ton of energy to make this built, and, and it doesn't work. So there's uh, uh, RC1 channel that's back to the 50s. There's better versions today uh, that use rubber isolators, pucks, all kinds of different little suspension gizmos and hat channels. So here's the idea is you mount Instead of mounting the sheetrock dire directly onto the stud, it's mounted on this on on. I'll show you a picture of that on hat channel, which is a little metal strip, which hat channel is then mounted on these various forms of isolating blocks. There's a bunch of different vendors that make those, and 
it blocks the transmission right at this po this place. Hmm. So the only remaining trans transmission is through the wall, through the insulation in the wall. And then what's left in the end is is sometimes up to STC 58, depending on what you're putting. This kind of wall, which would be sheetrock, what's called a eighth inch mass loaded vinyl barrier, MLV, um, which is really just adding mass. It's not a decoupling material and right. it's not a damping layer. It's just a way to get one pound per square foot of mass in just an eighth inch of material. Just it's more a, stuff. <laughs> it's just it's just heavier and it's it's yeah. lint mass, so it like doesn't rattle and vibrate. Yeah. Uh, it's basically soft vinyl with metal particles in it. Works it works well for the application. So now instead of just having the about pound and a half per square foot of sheetrock, uh, pound one point five one point eight, we've added another pound. Mm -hmm. We're floating all of that on this rubber isolator. On the back side, we got two layers of sheetrock, and in the end, we can get an, uh, an STC of 58 just out of this, with reasonable low frequency performance. And uh, is that bushing? It looks like it, it looks like the way that it's constructed. After the hat channel, then there's the bushing, and then the two by four. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so this is what it looks like from the side. I'm I'm bringing ah, this one up. This is the uh, PAC, which is stands for Pacific International. Um, RSIC1, uh, mm -hmm. PAC is actually the distributor in the US. This thing was developed in Australia by Rondo, a construction company. I, I bumped into these people at a CDS show. Wow, is it 20 years ago, 18 years wow. ago? Saw that thing, it was like, wow, this thing is so cool. And I've then uh, PAC, <laughs> yeah, uh, PAC started to import into the US. There's now lots of derivatives of this, lots of copycats, lots of different things, but this is sort of the grandfather of this industry. So the the, the clip looks like this you mount mm -hmm. hat channel on it which is also known as dual leg uh, non-resilient channel and it gets mounted on the stud this way oh there uh, what, you go. I'm, cool. what, I'm, what i'm missing here is the fastener there's a screw that gets put into the stud so mm -hmm. you build your stud you you put this this uh bushing with a screw in there you mount the hat channel on there you mount your one or two or, or i don't i'd never do three layers of sheetrock on that but you put your your sheetrock layers on there and then you're you're done um uh, warning uh this hat channel the first one that you squeeze to put in, it'll be fine. The fifth one will be fine. By the twentieth, you 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 your uh, pain. Out. Yeah, your so, <laughs> Use a, uh, use the right materials. There's actually a vice grip you can get for um that's made for uh for oil filters. That's made for that. That's a perfect size oh, for the to go clamp on that. And if you're going to install those, uh, definitely use that. They usually get put on around twenty four inch centers this way along mm -hmm. the width. So around 60 centimeters and around 16 inch, 16 to 20 inch centers vertically. Um, so it, it's not a lot. Uh, each one of these things costs, I forget now, about six bucks on, on the market. So it's a good way to do it. All right. Enough of that propaganda for these guys. Mm -hmm. Another isolation strategy, and I'd shown you that in the early first set of, draw, of uh, drawings, is uh, mm -hmm. what's known as a staggered stud wall, where the sound that hits one plate has nowhere to go. Physically, mm -hmm. it can't get through here and reconnect. It can only go through the wall. It will go through the top and bottom plates, but that's a, that's all secured at the top and the right. bottom of the structure, so it doesn't rattle quite through. Mm -hmm. And you can get SDC 60 out of this. I don't know if you remember those drawings from a while back. Uh, that works pretty well. Not very well at low frequencies because there's not enough of a depth. Mm -hmm. And the right way to do it if you're doing a wall and you really want good sound isolation is this, which is two completely separate walls layers uh, one two or three layers of sheetrock on one side or or gypsum board on one side one or two or three layers of gypsum board on the other side nice big air gap no intermediate layers mm -hmm. anything you put in here is going to create small cavities that is going to transmit the base through and that won't work so your you, a big open cavities is your friend so the base doesn't get compressed in there and uh, you can get really good sound isolation of this structure without a lot of weight um, Note that I'm on this drawing, I'm only showing a single layer of sheetrock. Right. Um, I would generally recommend if you're building a theater, this is going to sound weird, is to put one layer of sheetrock over here uh -huh. with some kind of damping material behind it. Uh, so maybe you can paint some green glue behind it. Maybe you can do something else that's going to damp it a little bit. And then uh -huh. on the back side, two or three layers. The idea being that the interior be relatively floppy so that it can absorb low frequency standing waves, which is going to transmit a little bit more into the cavity, admitted, mm -hmm. but then you're going to compensate by adding Make more mass on the backside. Yeah. yeah. So that's the right way to build that. All right. 
So uh, this is a way to do a retrofit of a staggered stud construction. If a, if a wall is already there and it's a two by four mm -hmm. plate, you can actually add a two by two plate. Um, so you're gonna take the sheetrock off on one side, preferably on the theater side, take the sheetrock off, add a two by two plate on the bottom. So, you know, inch and a half by inch and a half, add intermediate studs at locations between the two originals and then rebuild. Now you got a staggered stud wall with relatively little impact. That's great. That that would have been my first question as as somebody who's constructing a theater. How do I do this if the theater's already built? But there there's a slide right there. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, there, there's actually a whole bunch of ways. Let me get yeah. up my coffee here. <laughs> Monday morning. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So with all of that, uh, here's uh, here's some transmission loss data of these different walls. Not STC, but the actual um, amount of sound that's lost in third octave bands. Mm -hmm. um, the red line over here represents regular regular construction. Uh, mind you, relative light, lightweight older, which is half inch drywall. Uh, I want to say 12 millimeter if I remember right. On studs, on 16 inch centers, uh, which is about 40 centimeters spacing between the studs. Uh, this is what you get. This is called an STC about 38. And that's, if you look at the line right here, I should have drawn lines, the mid frequency is around 38. It goes up, it goes down. There's yeah. a little bit of a dip over here. I'll explain that later. But then at low frequency, just following an, a mass law, you, it gets lost, gets lost to the point where at 125 hertz, which isn't even the lowest frequency we're interested in, we only have 12 dB of sound break between room A and room B. So let's review. Big loud scene in a movie going rumble, 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 rumble. The bass is going 110 dB. Like, because mm -hmm. you've got big subwoofers and it's just like, Wah! and you're like, sure. oh, yeah, I love it. What's in the room next door? If, if we're, we want to have a 60 dip, the difference of 60, right? Well, right now with this wall construction, if you have 110 dB, let's say 112 dB in mm -hmm. the room and base, what's in the room next door? So would that be 62? No, take a look at this. So we're, at best, we're only dropping 12 dB. We have oh, 112 okay. in the main room. What's next door? 100. Monday morning. I apologize, Monday morning. No, no problem. <laughs> so, so there's 100 dB next door. Is the yeah. person sleeping in the middle of the night because they do not have um, uh, they do not have insomnia, but you do? Are they happy? They're not happy. No they're way. Gonna, yeah. You're gonna hear some kind of angry things. Okay. So then we go to what a lot of people do is like, I'll do double drywall. And remember that the STC improvement of the double drywall was something like five dB, I think. Um, and in the mid-range, not a big improvement. Um, you know, right over here, you just get a little bit more. But the the added STC points are in this region because we've added mass. Mm -hmm. So between 200 hertz and about 1,000 hertz, there's you know there's about 10 dB improvement. The STC curve is only five because this is no better. At low at low frequency, it's no better. In the higher frequencies, it's really no better. It's in the mid-range that it's better. So it's an improvement, but really not worth it. Now we go to the staggered stud wall, the one that I just showed where you have the studs mm -hmm. that are offset by adding an extra plate. And we get a very good improvement at low frequency. Look at this. We're going from 12 dB to about 35 dB. This is, mm -hmm. this is a lot That's better. That's really good, yeah. Uh, not a lot better at the higher frequencies. And what is going on here? So this is what's called a coincidence dip. This is actually where the sheetrock on one side and the sheetrock on the other side are acting like like little drum heads. They're going bing, bing. Uh, if you really hit sheetrock with your knuckles, you'll hear that it's, you know, it's a kind of hardish material and it's gonna, yeah. I'm sorry, a uh, gypsum board, not sheetrock. Mm -hmm. It's gonna mm -hmm. resonate. So here it resonates uh, on the same on both sides. And the way you get rid of that is to put some damping material, different thicknesses of sheetrock, whatever, or gypsum board. Now we finally get to the double stud, you know, where there's two completely isolated studs and check this out. So this is a five eighths uh, gypsum board with uh, insulation all inside. And so now we're all the way up at 60 dB of isolation mm -hmm. with up to 40 dB at the low frequencies, which is now starting to be significant. Right. And if we do double layers by adding more mass, we get even better performance So where the, where the base is 45s and 50s. So that just shows the progression, okay? So I've spent half of the time just talking about sound ISO, and I do that because it's important. Now, I've only talked about the walls. Yeah. Uh, what about the floor? Where the floor right. is all the same theories, it's all the same stuff. You can add concrete all you want until you decouple, until you actually mount a layer of 
of plywood, preferably two layers of plywood on rubber blocks. You're not going to you're not going to stop the sound from going downstairs or the mm-hmm. sound from below coming up. And there's a bunch of companies that make isolation pads that are either one inch, you know, two and a half centimeters thick or two inches thick. There's there's a bunch of choices. Sometimes you can get these isolation mats that are a continuous layer of rubber material that you put uh, layers of plywood on and you put your final floor. This is what you have to do. And mm-hmm. if you uh, want really good sound transmission control, realize that if if this gap, if this gap is only one inch, as in two and a half centimeters, um, you're not going to get very good low frequency control. So you need a, a you need a bigger gap, and you can do that that by either using taller blocks mm-hmm. or by uh, building sort of a, a grid structure out of out of wood. Um, and then put the blocks on top so that you end up with a net bigger gap. And the bigger the gap, the better the low frequency control. Sure. So that's important for the floor. Same thing for the ceiling. Okay. So what's the point of having walls isolated if the ceiling is not? Right. So spoiler alert, or let me let me uh let me avoid you a whole bunch of trouble. Let's say there's a bedroom next door to the theater, and you build this big stout wall with double layers of sheetrock or or gypsum board and all the stuff that I've said this is what you're going to do but you don't do anything to the ceiling the sound's mm-hmm. going to hit, hit the ceilings it's going to go over structure, and it's going to go yeah. right through the joist yeah. and travel over to the room next door and transfer down and you're going right. to go oh it's not going to do that much it will do a lot um, yeah well, especially it if every other much. structure around it is is good that's the weak point so that's what's going to take all the right. abuse right exactly and so uh the the joist the the construction or even concrete is going to just transfer the vibration across mm-hmm. as long as there's vibration structure like you said there's sound transmission so um you got to isolate the ceiling i've just gener- generally and simply shown you know some kind of isolator there's spring isolators rubber isolators all mm-hmm. kinds of different products made by the industry out there whatever you're going to do just remember to do the the ceiling everything i just described for the walls uh, uh, is true here it's, just mass doesn't help you need to decouple you need to damp you need to have the right amount of mass the right amount of decoupling the right amount of damping and then everything works for more on that look through the reference books the manufacturers of these things will give you the data to show you what the structures do how much sound isolation they provide is is there a preferred method when you look at like rubber versus springs or is it mm-hmm. like as long as you do something you're okay uh, that's a good question. And so that's that's where a session like this goes from a real overview to, <laughs> to like a four t- hour long thing. <laughs> so uh, rubber works well at mid and high frequencies, doesn't work well at low frequencies because oh, it's yeah, going to vibrate together. So imagine building a luxury car and instead mm-hmm. of springs that have a very big deflection, you put the suspension on rubber blocks. Right. Every bump you're going to feel. Big, you may big, not big, feel big a little stuff on the road, a little grit. But mm-hmm. you can, every time there's a bump, you're going to feel it. Got it. And for that, springs are better. So the better springs made by a few different companies out there, I'll, I'll mention a few names. So one of them that's very active in our industry is Kinetics Noise Control. Um, Mason Industries is another company. I see, I'd say those are the two big companies. There's a bunch of other ones. They sure. make ceiling isolation springs that have a deflection of one inch. So you you mount these springs on the on the joists. You hang the from those springs. You you hang uh, metal cross beams, you mount the, the the gypsum board and other mass layers under that. And when everything is deflected, it goes down one inch and it floats up and down one inch. And so that amount of deflection means you're going to have very good isolation down to very low frequency and things are going to work. Uh, if you just use a rubber block, it's just not going to control very well. Got it. Got it. Cool. Good. Yeah, the, 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 the car analogy is great. I was actually thinking about that earlier, about the, the way springs do the opposite of what the road's doing. So, yeah, that, that all makes sense. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, when it, when a car is well well built, I, I love watching this when you're driving along the road and you look at the wheels on the car next to you and yeah. they're bouncing up and down and the car's, the car's not. The car's smooth. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay. And that's all a ratio of the spring constant, how hard it is, what's the mass here, what's the right. mass there. Right, and so right. if I had more time, I'd go into the fact that you need to engineer this whole thing so that the the uh, the the mass of the structure has a resonance that's much, much lower than the lowest frequency you want to do, usually three to five hertz, which mm-hmm. means that 
the uh, the whole system uh, can vibrate and not transfer through. And that's about all I'm going to say. Otherwise, we'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thank you. Now, one one of the things that's really really critical about sound isolation construction is it's all good to build all these wall structures that block the sound really well. If you don't control how sounds uh, transferring at the corners, the all of the junctions, you're going to have sound oh, yeah. leaks and things are going to be a problem. So, this is just trying to show what happens on a regular corner that's well built with a single layer sheetrock, you mm -hmm. wanna make sure you overlap the layers and you put caulk in here and you do a good job. Right. Preferably when you're doing two layers, you overlap them this way where it's like a little zigzag, you put caulk in here um, and then it prevents the sound from leaking through. But you gotta make sure that all of the junctions are properly sealed, properly caulked, that there's no sound going through. And I'm sorry, just a little sheet of paper with a bit of plaster on it does not block the sound yeah. from going through. Yeah. You really need, uh, caulk. I sometimes put bituthene at the corners, like this, you know, kind of a, a a window isolation version of um of a hush mat. So uh, you got to worry about that. All right. Um, doors and windows. So let's say you build a room, you do all this stuff with the walls and mm -hmm. the ceiling, and you put regular doors and windows. They're they're going to be the weak link. The doors have to be solid and heavy, internally mm -hmm. damped. They have to have seals all the way around them. Same thing for windows. Uh, this diagram shows uh, uh, some things that a proper isolation door is going to have, which is a seal on the bottom that that actually pushes down when you close the door. Um, you, you need preferably double seals so that when the door closes, there's actually two locations for the seal to block. Um, there's some manufacturers that make metal clad doors in which the seals are actually like um, refrigerator magnets. Oh, you know, sure. today's fridges, the, they're, they're all catching a metal door mm -hmm. with this magnetic structure. And you can get sound doors that are built that same way or sound rated oh, cool. doors that are built that same way. The better ones, the, the ones that are actually claiming STC 55 mm -hmm. have two sets of magnets. So the, the door zigzags around. They work well. If you tune them correctly, there's no sound that goes through there. Now, I, I, would, I would assume that these are doors that you can't just go buy at your local hardware store. These are specialty like acoustic doors, I'm guessing, yes? Correct. These are specialty made-to-order acoustic doors. There's a few companies that carry a stock of the most top typical sizes. So, you know, a, a 30 inch by 80 inch is a very common size. They have it in stock. They can ship it right away. The other sizes, you always have to order them. It takes three weeks, four weeks. Don't don't oh, get sure. caught at expecting you're going to go buy this directly. And uh, <laughs> Also, don't get caught thinking that when you get to delivery of this after your four week of order time and week long uh, shipping on a flatbed, don't think you're going to go move the door off the truck. Oh, yeah, I think weighs a ton, I'm sure. 300 pounds at Woo! minimum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's going to take a few people to move that thing off the truck and down the stairs to get down into the into the, the cinema basement. Just be, be aware of that. Um, all the same thing with windows. Uh, windows mm -hmm. are a weak link. If you've got a uh, cinema with windows to the outside and the neighbor's backyard is right there, you're not going to be able to use it all the time. So you got to think double windows uh, with big distances between them. By the way, a, a regular window with a half inch gap is not going to be enough to, to block the sound from going through. You really need like half inch to three quarter inch structures mm -hmm. and big gaps between them with proper seals and all of that. I had a, a a place I lived in a few years ago had a big sliding glass door to go out to the backyard from the from the living room. Yeah. And that sliding glass door rattled so much when I tried to play music or watch movies. It was the worst. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah they do rattle, and yeah. rattle means it's transmitting, but it's also adding uh, unwanted right. distortions inside the room. So not yeah, it was not good. Super annoying. Um. Okay, uh, now if you can actually influence the architecture and placement of doors in the residence, you know, if you can offset the doors and if this was a bedroom and that was the theater or the other way around, let's say this is the cinema, that's the bedroom, you can see the closet over here. Try to put the doors at opposite sides of the hallway so the sound doesn't leak right through. That's Those nice are simple tip. little things you can do to, yeah, to help. Yeah, good tip, I like that. Okay, summary of all of this. On the first part, we're an hour into this. Again, it looks like I'm going to go over time. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you guys need to go about your business, I won't I won't take it uh, with any uh, any agony that you have to mm -hmm. log off. Remember, this is being uh, recorded. People still yeah, we'll have it taped. Up. You're not using yeah, we'll, tape, right, to record we're, this? No, we're not, we're not. We're not taping it, no. <laughs> but taping but, it. but, we, are, but we are recording it. You're recording <laughs> it. You're, you're bitting it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I'm going to continue there. You know, you can watch this on the YouTube uh, channel later. Um, so 
summary of all of the first part of acoustics, which is the sound isolation, which again is really, really key to have mm -hmm. proper use of the room, keep the background noise way down in the room so you can actually hear every subtlety in the surround sound field or in the music and all that, uh, is mass, you're gonna need a lot of it for that to work. Mm -hmm. Decoupling is effective and complicated. Uh, damping is effective and simple. Uh, you got In reality, you wanna do the right amount of all three right. and make it work. It's complicated and expensive. Um, now, how do you do this? Uh, you can either try it yourselves, uh, you know, read the books, go through the webinars. This is a total just introduction. If you go off and start to try to build rooms from this, you may run into trouble because you may actually not realize something you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I would hire an acoustical consultant, either somebody who specializes in home cinemas like, like my firm. And to be fair, there's three or four other good firms around the U.S. that do this stuff. Um, a regular... Uh, acoustical consultant, a company that, that that's what they do, they don't know anything about home cinema, can still help you with uh, designing this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Or you can read books. There's a bunch of really good, good uh, materials written on this. I've got my usual list of references at the end of the session. So, all right, enough on that. Let's move to the next thing that matters in acoustics, which is the control of the background noise. Now, mm -hmm. we care about background noise uh, because uh, uh, they a high amount of background noise actually interferes with your sense of loudness. So best example is you're driving in your car um, and you've got the music pl playing at a good level. It, yeah. You know, you've turned it up to where you're like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm loving listening to this rap tune because uh, that's all I listen to is rap. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, and then you pull off the freeway and you stop and, and suddenly it sounds like the, the volume got turned up. Yeah. Did the volume get turned up? No. I mean, no, you're, but your frame of reference changed. Right. The background noise, the road noise went from 65 dB or so to zero or mm -hmm. close to zero. And, you know, maybe call it 30 with the engine noise. So suddenly you're like, man, who turned up the radio? Nobody right. did. And it's the same thing in a home cinema. If there's a high level of background noise, which is not uncommon in spaces that have ventilation or refrigeration nearby or freeways or wind noise nearby, you're gonna to have to crank the volume up quite a bit before you get a sense of loudness. And what that's good, what that's gonna do is it's gonna fatigue your tweeters and woofers and mid ranges, it's gonna fatigue your hearing, it's not a good idea. Um, transient noise, which is noise that turns on and off, which could be ventilation, could be a, a big refrigerator unit nearby, that's distracting because it usually is going to turn on in the quiet scene in the movie when like there's like this little whisper of information being told suddenly, go, 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 go. You, you hear this thing turning on, so you're right. not in the movie anymore. Um, and then um, it generally masks the overall dynamic range. So the low level signals are lost, uh, even, you know, if you turn the volume back down to where it was supposed to be, you're not going to get all the little subtle effects. I've now mentioned that 16 times. Mm -hmm. You need about 100 dB of dynamic range for everything to work. What I mean is the difference between the background noise and the loudest thing you want to hear should be at least 100 decibels. Right. Um, now, people are all excited about 24-bit uh, recordings. Mm -hmm. I want to remind you that 16-bit has a dynamic range of 96 decibels. Right. And 24-bit has a dynamic range of 144 dB. So if you want to hear the benefits of 24-bit, you need to be in a room with a dynamic range of 144 dB. That means the noise floor needs to be at zero right. for one point, which is like below the threshold, you know, right at the threshold here. You, there's nothing. Yeah. And you need to have the peak levels be able to play 140, 40 B, which is above the threshold of pain, for you to hear all of the benefits of of 24 bit recordings. Mm -hmm. Just to set the record straight. So let's just say we're just listening to 20 bit recordings, which is the majority of what's in film soundtracks these days, whether it's Dolby Digital or DTS or any of the other formats. So you need more than 100 dB dynamic range in the room. So the noise floor needs to be low enough, which means the noise needs to be at around 20 dB so that you can add another 80 on top of that to get to 100, okay? If you're not doing that, you're not hearing all the subtlety in the bottom end, and you're not benefiting from the better quality uh, recordings today. So I just threw this thing called NC in here. What's this? I didn't say decibels, I said NC. The reason I said NC is a similar thing as STC, which is the human hearing doesn't hear at low level equally at all frequencies, or at high level for that matter. We're a lot less sensitive to low frequencies than we are at high frequencies. And because of that, the uh, acoustics industry uh, has settled 
for years and years and years on this series of curves called the noise criteria, which is a correspondent perceived level. There's a newer version of this called the RC curve, which I, I won't get into. It's a, it is better, but I'll just keep with a venerable old value. So um, here are uh, level curves that represent what the hearing system can hear. So I talked about this NC20 which is ideally the background noise in your room. If you measured it with a really good microphone, really good preamplifier, uh, not, uh, you know that little USB microphone you got? Oh yeah. That's oh, yeah. unfortunately not good enough to measure that low of a level because it's it's just too small of a capsule. You really need too a half inch or yeah. inch capsule to measure yeah. that. But mm -hmm. if you had a really good test microphone, you can rent them, by the way, the microphone and preamp. Um, that NC20 would mean that in the mid frequencies right here, the measured level would be 20 decibels. Okay. On the on the measurement scale where where zero dB res, represents 20 micropascals of pressure. Yeah, I'm getting scientific here. Sorry. Um, it also means that at high frequency, the level is 16 dB. It also means that 125 level the level could, 125 hertz the level can go up to 42 dB, and at 63 hertz the level could be up to 50 decibels and still meet that criteria, their perceived value of being 20 dB. So we're, we're a lot more tolerant at the lower frequencies than we are at the higher frequencies. Um, and so on and so forth at all of the, the different NC values. Now, here's an example of NC40. This would be a measured background noise overlaid over the NC curves. This is a, if you measured this in a room, this is a room that you could argue, actually you could argue that it slightly fails right here, but I would give it a passing grade within a half a dB, which means that it handily meets here at this frequency, mm -hmm. handily meets the NC30 curve, this sort of purplish one, but it fails to meet that here. And so the way the way the NC curve uh, works is you me you measure the room, you overlay it over all of the family of curves, and whichever one it doesn't fail is the noise criteria. So this is a little different to the way STC is done in that there's an average of how much you're passing and failing. This is very strict. It's like if any of the bands fail to meet that curve, boop, you're you're relegated you're to the here. next level up. You're out of yeah. here. And the next level up's not one dB, it's actually in five dB steps. Oh wow, well, okay. Anyway, most movie theaters you go into are gonna fit somewhere around this curve, N C thirty. And that's Really, for good quality performance, that's not good enough. You want to be 25 or 20 for really good performance. Okay? What's, what's causing it in the commercial theater to be that high? It, I, mean, would, I would think that a commercial theater would be as good as it could be, you know, considering it's commercial, but but that seems excessive, right? Um, well, so so ventilation. You you got to put air into the room yep. to either heat or cool the room, and that air is you know makes noise as it's rushing through the ducts and coming out yep. the vents, and as the air is getting churned by the fan that's pushing all of that, it's it's basically just air handler noise in most cases. Um, that that it, that's that's the biggest thing at my house is when I'm watching a movie that's very yeah. dialogue heavy. I'm, yeah. I'm constantly turning the AC off for for just that movie or just part of that movie just so I could. You know, going back to what you said before, the background noise is too high. Yeah, and that's really, really common. So yeah. even in, in relatively new construction, it's very common for ventilation. People go, look, I'm just going to push enough air in here that it's, you know, it's maintaining temperature, but they're not thinking about these levels of NC. Right, so right. Really good ventilation contractors and engineers know the NC curve, and they'll actually design to that um, and sometimes take some risks on it. But but uh, uh, you, if if you want to meet these criteria, you you really do need to hire an acoustical consultant, whether or not they specialize in theater. I I would say look for people who are actually are quite well versed in media and and theater designs yeah. uh, or cinema designs and and uh, performance halls to make that right. So how do we control this? Uh, so I'm going to give you a few things that you can actually hand the ventilation contractor and go, look, what I want is a room that's NC20 or 25. That means cool. that you need to give me ducts in which the air velocity is less than 500 feet per minute. 500 feet per minute, I forget what it is in miles per hour, it's like 12 mm -hmm. miles per hour. That means that the air is not moving so fast through the ducts that it's making a bunch of noise, number one. Number two is at the end of that branch, when it breaks into like the little different registers, I don't want more than 250 feet per minute at the registers. Okay, whatever is the overall mass of air that you're moving through the room it, that's measured in in CFM cubic feet uh, per minute. The what I want is the velocity in the ducts to not be so fast that it's making noise. So 
if you tell the ventilation contractor this, they're first going to go, whoa, those are really big ducts. Yes. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so um, in addition to that, you want slightly longer ducts and you want some turns. Every turn of the duct is going to actually block the noise from the fan that's coming upstream. Um, if you can use plenum silencers, which along the way is a box that, let's say you have a 12 inch duct that's coming from the ventilation unit to the room. If that, if that uh, duct can actually break and, and be put into a box that's maybe two feet wide by two feet tall by three feet long and then continue on, that thing acts like a muffler in the car and yeah, will reduce the noise. Yep, it'll just reduce the noise from the fan up, upstream. Uh, if you can use lined ductwork, which is ductwork that actually has a fiber lining inside that acts as a muffler, wow. that helps a lot. And there's there's actually specially made flex duct that's acoustically rated that'll block a certain amount, number of decibels per foot. That's really useful. Nice. Um, and at the end, you want to make sure that as the air goes in the room, it's not going to go shh yeah. through the grills. And yeah. some of them are rated in the amount of noise. So you want to make sure you use low noise air grills. Uh, now, uh, all of that, everything I just described is about the air going into the room, mm -hmm. but you also want to make sure that the ventilation unit, wherever it's bolted down into the structure of the building, is isolated. So uh, I see sometimes air units that are mounted on, on rubber blocks, yeah. and then yeah. there's a giant bolt going down into the structure of the building. Does that work? Mm. Yet. That's, uh, I could see how somebody would think it would work. Because you're yeah. putting the rubber feet on there and isolating it, but it yeah. probably doesn't work, I'm guessing. It, it doesn't work because the rubber bolt is mm -hmm. conducting vibration down into the into the structure. So what you yeah. need if touching. you're going to mount yeah. that thing is ideally springs. And mm -hmm. the companies I mentioned earlier, Kinetics Noise Control and Mason Industries, make all kinds of different springs, some seismic, seismically rated and other things that you can put the ventilation system onto. And then the whole thing is suspended. And you do need to rate the weight of the suspension to the wrong way around you need to rate uh rate the spring to the weight of the suspension so if this if the unit weighs 500 pounds mm -hmm. uh you need four 100 pound springs but wait there's more 100 pound units never have the same weight on all four corners oh yeah that's a good point spoiler. Yep. not a spoiler yep. Warning. So this is this yeah. is where these these presentations go can go for five hours. I'll just say, <laughs> don't just look at the spec sheet of the isolation of of the unit you have to isolate and go. Oh, it's two hundred pounds. I need one quarter of that. You right. actually want to know what's the load on each one of the four quarters. Quarter. So they're never going to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And so what you need to do, if you want this thing to work, if you if you actually said this is a hundred pound unit, I'm putting twenty five uh, twenty five pound springs all the way around. What's going to happen is one spring is going to get totally crushed. That's the yeah. one where the the main electric device is sitting, and the other three yeah. are going to like flopping up. You, That's you not know what that you know what that reminds me of is when you put way too much stuff in your trunk of your car, and your yeah. you know, your car's like this. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's That's a front wheel drive car, and you're trying to go up a hill in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not going to um, be fun. That's not going to work. So uh, to do a good job of this, you actually want the ventilation contractor to take the unit out of its box, weigh the four corners, and find out yeah. what it is, right. um, or find out from the manufacturer what the weights are. This is the same thing as I would keep talking about in the speakers. It's like, what's really going on? You can call the manufacturer, mm -hmm. talk to engineer, and go, I want to know the load at, load at the four corners or all of the mounting points, and they mm -hmm. probably know. Yeah. All right. Enough on uh, noise control. I could go on and on and on. Note, note that I've limited the noise control to ventilation because that's the, like, like we talked about a second ago, that's the biggest source of noise. But uh, there's yeah. other noise, which is if there's a refrigerator put in the room, mm -hmm. because in the design of it, there's a bar at the back of the room yeah. and there's a fridge and an ice maker, those things are going to be noisy yeah, and, and yeah. you got to control those. So yeah. I've actually worked on projects where, where there was an insistence of having a fridge, and we actually took the whole compressor unit out of the of the the fridge, moved Outward it outside, it. Yeah. ran some pipes and ducts, which is yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. So you you know you start with a six hundred dollar fridge that now costs you know three thousand dollars, yeah. and that's yeah. what you got to do. <laughs> wow. But um, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Other source work. of noise, of course, is fans uh, in equipment. And the biggest one is video projectors. So oh, yeah. you, you do this beautiful room, really expensive speakers, everything is done wonderfully. You've done everything you can on the sound ISO. And then you hang a projector up there that the manufacturer said, oh, it's really quiet. Yeah. Dude, yeah. as long as there's a fan in it, it's not quiet enough. That's kind of how yeah. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Um, you want to, you absolutely, of course, want to measure it, but 
Uh, one very, very quick thing you can do is to, to find out if it's quiet enough is you walk in the room, turn on the projector, plug your ears, mm -hmm. let let your internal dynamic range go down a little bit. Yeah. You know, plug your ears for a few seconds and then unplug your ears and listen. You're going to hear that projector. You'll hear it right away. Yeah. You're going to hear all that stuff. You don't even need a microphone to know that's mm -hmm. not good enough. I've done a lot of video calibration where a big giant projector, like some of the really physically big ones, are, are in a box or something to help. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you see that, that as well. So that's what you should do. The projector should be mounted. It should either be in the back of the room, actually, in this room, it would be over there, uh, yeah. behind a port glass, completely, you know, away from the room, like it is in movie theaters. Yeah. Or if you can't have a separate space for it, and by the way, a port glass is typically up to six millimeters, say quarter inch mm -hmm. of pure white. Uh, uh, glass with anti-reflective coating on either side. When you put that in, it's going to drop about uh, maybe three percent of light. No big yeah. deal. No, you can't no, use no. regular glass. It's going to the regular glass is green. It's going to mm -hmm. don't do that. It's got to be port glass. It's going to cost three to five hundred dollars. That's what you need. Um, or if you can't do that, you need to put the projector in a, in a hush box, an enclosure. Yep. It can be uh, hidden as a big soffit in the back, but you got to mm -hmm. ventilate it. Uh, you got to you know you got to do all of that, and it gets complicated. Yeah. So. Those are the main sources of noise. Projectors, uh, uh, an equipment rack with amplifiers and other things that have fans in them, and of course mm -hmm. the ventilation, refrigeration, those things. Um, and I'm I'm kind of looking at that separate from the noise of the outside. So if there's a freeway nearby and its noise is coming into the room, yeah, that is background room, but you're going to control that by the sound isolation that we talked about in the first yeah. uh, half of this. You would, you would hate my house. You'd hate my house, Anthony. It's I, I live downtown. There's a little airport right here. There's water right here. So we always hear boats and jet skis and stuff. A loud air conditioner, ceiling fans. You'd probably walk in my room and go, ugh. Uh, <laughs> I have two words for you. Headphones. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the sound isolating type, like these etymotics I'm wearing here that are blocking mm -hmm. everything from the outside. Sure, All right. Sure. Final phase, and and I'm going to go through this quickly. Why? Because I've talked about this, I don't know, six times in various yeah. webinars. There was yeah. a whole webinar on this, so I'm going to go through like re really quick motions on this. So, big stuff, yeah. as a reminder, we're, uh, we're going to talk about sound reflection control because in a room with no treatments, you're going to hear some direct sound from the speaker, and then there's going to be some reflections bouncing around the room. If they're out of control, they're going to add some uh, distort some potentially unwanted distortion in the form of comb filters and other spatial errors. Uh, there's a few reflections. Here's more reflections coming off the right side of the room. Some of them are going to hit directly back to your. Some of them are going to bounce around the room three or four times before they hit you. Uh, and then there's more reflections from the left side of the room. All told, if you don't control the, the reflections in the room, you're going to have chaos. Chaos because overall, as you can see in this diagram, there is a lot more red arrows of sound energy coming back to you than the direct sound. Mm -hmm. Granted, each one of them is a little lower level than the direct sound, but overall they contribute enough energy that there's three or four times more reflected energy than direct sound. And so your brain's kind of confused, like, whoa, what's going on? And then mm -hmm. they can introduce comb filters, errors, soften up the sound, not good. So you got to do something about this. I think I've mentioned this, like I said, in these webinars right from the mm -hmm. start, late March. So oh, yeah. uh, you got to control this. Uh, now, I, I will use the same diagram to talk about dispersion of speakers as I do uh, acoustical control. An ideal system is one in which you got the right dispersion and the right acoustical control. Let's look at that. Now, people are going to go, well, I don't know, I'm in my room. I, I It's untreated. I can hear the sounds coming from my front speakers. I, you know, that guy's full of BS because he's got a BS and EE. Uh, well, that's because our brain, our ear and brain system focuses on the first arriving sound. There's actually a little, uh, uh, an important signal processing uh, element going on in our minds that that when there's many sounds coming from all these different places, we pay attention to where the first one is coming from. We actually compare all of those patterns and go, okay, this is the mm -hmm. first one, that's where it's coming from. And it, and it's very effective if the reflection patterns are consistent with the direct sound. So the the better a speaker dispersion is, you know, the more even it is so that the reflections are the same as the, ref as the direct sound, the easier it is for our brain to go, oh, there's the direct sound, here's the reflected sound, uh, trying to do that the same, mm -hmm. and therefore that reflected sound came, coming from over there, I'm, I'm going to ignore that. It's a really powerful process in our brain. It does take brain power. So you're sitting there for two hours of a movie with your brain trying to untangle what's the direct sound from what's the reflected sound coming from the center speaker, the left speaker, the surround speaker, and in the end, it's fatiguing. 
uh, you don't want to do this to your customer. Mm -hmm. You want them to right. enjoy the movie without any any hassles. Um, now, uh, this is what the different reflected sounds would look like in a room in which you haven't done anything to control the chaos, which is there'd be some direct sounds, some clusters mm -hmm. of reflected sounds. There's all of these uh, these um, groups that mean that instead of having really smooth decay in the room, it's going to be chaotic. What we're looking for is a really smooth decay of sound. We're not looking to eliminate the sound. So I'm going to, the reflected sound, I'm going to say this about four times here. We want some reflected sound in the room, but we want it to be controlled. We want it to be manipulated in a way by the treatments we're about to talk about, and we want it to be a really smooth decay over time. So the elements you're going to put on the wall uh, to control the sound reflections are either absorption uh, or scattering devices. So you're either going to suck out the energy or you're going to break it up into small pieces. Um, why don't you just eliminate it all? I just said a second yeah. ago, we don't want to eliminate all the reflections. Why not? Well, why not? Because you have come to expect that when you walk into a room of a certain size, there's a certain amount of reflections that come around you. That's just programmed into our brain mm -hmm. from a very early age. And if you eliminate them all, if you actually put absorption everywhere, if you put one inch of absorption, that's really bad. If you put four inches of absorption, it's also really bad uh, all the way around. And why? Because your brain suddenly in this starved environment where you're like you hear sound coming from the source and you see that there's walls everywhere around, but there's no reflections. And the internal little data computer in your brain goes, ah, something's wrong. Yeah. That sounds like an evolutionary thing. You know, I, I can't think of a time as humans where we've ever we've ever lived and, and worked in a dead silent environment. So I think no. that's biological, right? It's it's biological. It's actually uh, a lot has been written about this in the literature on psychoacoustics. And yeah. uh, I'm not going to say very much because I, I can you know go way down this path. <laughs> I'm just going to say uh, our brain has learned to that when we're in a room. And there's we our eyes see a certain pattern in certain structures. We should expect a certain amount of reflection, and right. we use that reflection to be able to figure out where's the first arriving sound. So the evolution mm -hmm. part of this is first arriving sound is usually where the very large animal with big teeth is making noise and coming from. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that, hey, that's where it is. You look at it, you evaluate, and you go, well, should I run or should I fight? Um, and those of us who did not have that evolutionary process or the god-given process depending on mm -hmm. what you believe died yeah we didn't procreate our kids uh that would have had that same error in their genes didn't exist so that just got eliminated so on the evolution point the people who have really good ability to go there's the sound even mm -hmm. under very reflective conditions like a forest a cave a place where there's a lot of reflections um those of us survived and our, our auditory system is really quick at that. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of data that says it's well under a millisecond. You can quickly hear it. Um, I actually almost got killed by a bus in London once uh, wow. that was coming from the wrong side as far as we're concerned. You know, they, over in England, they drive on the wrong side of the yeah. street, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't want an argument. We drive on the right side of the street. They drive on the wrong side of the street. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, there's a lot of really interesting reasons why that happened. Anyway, yeah. I walk off the what they call pavement over there. It's called the sidewalk mm -hmm. over here. And I look, you know, where do I look? I look at, you know, where we normally do, which is in that direction. Yeah. And there's a sign on the side that says look left. And yeah. you know, I'm ignoring it. And <laughs> very quickly, my auditory system says, Well, there's a sound sound outside of a few, your field of vision. You better do something. Yeah, I quickly turn yeah. around and step back in the mirror of that Leland <laughs> bus. Just went. Ooh, man, oh man, oh man, didn't oh man. Get a nose job out of it, but pretty close. You if I didn't have the that wind. program, then <laughs> it was that close. Very close. <laughs> All right. Um, so we need to prefer, preserve some reflections to support the speakers and make it all sound right. Uh, there's the right amount. So what we want ultimately, and this is this is seen from the top. I'm going to expand on this in a second. Is we want a room in which there is a direct sound. And there's some reflections that are absorbed, some that are scattered, some that are absorbed, some that are scattered, some that are absorbed, some that are scattered, and so on and so forth, so that we overall have an orderly character to the sound reflections of the room. We're not eliminating them, we're just taking control of them. That's what I mean by control. So ultimately, this diagram shows that we're sitting in here, we're hearing a nice sound field, we're hearing the direct sound from the speaker, we're hearing some reflections around the walls and, and the ceiling, but it's all controlled. And in the end, uh, the feeling we have is there's a direct sound and there's a nice enveloping crescent of sound energy all the way around us that is comfortable, right? Smooth immersion. Now, uh, what's the recipe? 
Um, believe it or not, all it takes in most listening rooms is only to, to take all of the reflected surfaces and apply only 15% of absorptive material. Uh, distributed evenly through the room, not mm -hmm. all lumped in one place here or there or right. there, but actually evenly laid out in the room so that um, the brain system hears some reflections and some absorption, or absorption means there's no sound reflecting, uh, but some reflections evenly all the way around the room. Um, the other thing that's really nice is about 20% of scattered diffusion surface also distributed evenly, interleaved with the absorption. So some of these theories of say, that say, put all the absorption toward the front of the room and all the diffusion in the back of the room, bad. Don't trust me on this. If you have time, go look up papers on the effects mm -hmm. of live and dead end rooms. Uh, one particular paper is called, uh, the Audio Engineering Society Journal called about, about diffusion and confusion, I think written by Sean Olive, if I, if I remember right, um, is a deep study into this. that. That doesn't work. What's better is to have absorption evenly distributed around and, and diffusion evenly distributed around. It works really well. And the nice thing about uh, diffusion is it adds the sense of spaciousness in the room, which is a thing people love. Um, I'm going to mention this really quickly. Um, I like to put what I call 2D diffusion towards the front of the room. That's diffusion that takes the sound vector and breaks it into a 2D plane, what's called a heavy disk. Mm -hmm. And I like to put uh, what I call 3D diffusion, not 3D of the calculation of a quadratic residue diffuser, but just 3D re-radiation towards the back of the room. So uh, this room, I'll see if I can do this with this camera. Um, so this room has, oh, I'm going to make everybody completely dizzy. So this room <laughs> has some 2D diffusers here, mm -hmm. 2D diffusers over here, oh, and cool. some 3D diffusers. These things over here, uh, yeah, there we go. These things over here will re-radiate the sound in a hemisphere, and mm -hmm. these things will re-radiate it into a hemi disc. Right. That works really good, and I'll explain why in a second. Yeah. And guys, if, if you really want to really geek out and dive deep into the, the different materials and, and things that Anthony's discussing, um, we, did a, uh, we did a whole webinar just on acoustic treatments about a month or six weeks ago, and it, it is on the YouTube channel. So if you want to right. really dive deep into the treatment, feel free to, to re-watch that one. Right. Um, so. The acoustics recipe, don't forget the ceiling. You, you also want to control how the reflections are having, hanging off the ceiling. Um, it is known in the, re, in the work in psychoacoustics in the literature that ceiling reflections tend to give a sense of a narrowing of the sound. That's because they hit your two ears at the same time, oh, which sure. means we interpret that as monoing up of the sound. You got to control that. We don't want sound that's all mashed up into a small ball in front of us. Um, don't forget base absorption. So people sometimes just put a few panels of one inch thick or two inch thick absorption around the room. That's only going to control the highs and mids, and mm -hmm. you got to take it all the way down to lower frequencies, or else the, uh, you're, you're going to have a very unbalanced sound. So, um, really quickly, one inch absorbers, 25 millimeters, controlled down to one kilohertz. That's not enough. Two inch panels, 50 millimeters, controlled down to 500 hertz. That's starting to get good four inch thick panels, 100 millimeters. I agree, they're ugly, but when we're talking about acoustics, you really want to do at least 100 millimeters, that's 10 mm -hmm. centimeters, that's four inches, to get uh, control down to 250 hertz. Um, you can also put a panel that's not very thick with a little bit of an air gap behind it, and it works down to a lower frequency, long reason why, let's keep moving on. So, don't overabsorb. How many yeah. times have I said that so far? Maybe lots and lots and four lots. or five times. <laughs> yeah. So if a little bit of aspirin is good, you just take the whole bottle. Just drink the whole bottle, yeah. <laughs> just take the yeah. whole bottle. Your last uh, headache what, you ever had. <laughs> <laughs> what happens next? Trip to the hospital to clean out your stomach. By the way, you yeah. won't die from that, but it's going to be really, really painful. Very, very painful, yeah. So there's the right amount. So uh, dead rooms just sound odd. I've already talked about it. I just keep saying it over and over again. There is an average target reflection decay time, and that's how acousticians talk about how much absorption is put in the room. Interesting as, interestingly, as the resulting time it takes for the sound to decay down to zero after you've put it in the room, and that usually is somewhere around 0.3 seconds in the room sizes we're working in for home sake. And um, if you put 15% coverage on your walls, uh, so if if that wall is 100 square feet, you're going to put only 15 square feet on there, right? That's 15%. Uh, you're going to get there. You're going to get to a point where you get that that reflection time. Now, <coughs> this stuff is ugly. 
Some designers are going to go, I, I don't want to put this stuff on the room. I want the room to look like Venetian plaster. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? There, there are plaster materials you can use. Oh, uh, let me get, where is that? That's here. Okay, I got ahead of myself. So you want to hide this stuff be behind acoustically transparent fabric, uh, behind a screen for, for uh, uh, like over here, the screen is not up, but, but what's behind is some absorbers. Uh, you can also do some custom prints on acoustically transparent fabric. Mm -hmm. You can do porous plaster. So there's about four vendors of these plaster materials that you apply sections of absorption on the wall. And then you fill them in with some filler material. Usually dense foam works well, not, not absorptive foam, but hard material. Then you plaster over the whole thing, and it can look like a room that's just got Phoenician plaster, and it's got the right amount of absorption. That's really cool. It looks really good. It's expensive. You know, it's 30 yeah. to $40 a square foot, sure. uh, but it looks really cool. Uh, you can also do micro perforated woods, slotted woods, perforated sheet metals. There's a whole bunch of different materials you can use to put in front of the absorption and diffusion that will hide the stuff and uh, not make it look like it's a laboratory like over here. Yeah, which I, um, I kind of, I, I don't, maybe I'm just the geek in me, I like that look. I don't know if you do too, but I, I've been in plenty of high-end homes, especially where they do not want to see any of that stuff. I totally yeah. get it, but I no. think it's cool, personally. Uh, you know, you're a geek. Uh, yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. That's how it is. Uh, yeah. I, I actually am of, of the school that I'd rather hide the stuff so that you walk yeah. in the room. There's a bit of an event when you look at the really cool structure of it, and then mm -hmm. you turn off the lights, you don't see any of and the stuff. Nothing. You, you could actually argue that all of the stuff on the walls, as long as it's dark surfaces, you don't see it. You're correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what we have over here is a lot of wood, which mm -hmm. is really beautiful, but the screen is going to reflect light off that. That's not a, sure. not a very good idea. So sure. um, now if you're going to actually... Uh, buy panels from vendors that make them. They come in all kinds of different shapes and beveled and radiuses and all this other stuff. Uh, just make sure they're covered with a fabric that is truly acoustically transparent, um, up to six kilohertz for just the treatments. Or if you're going to hide the speakers behind those fabrics, it needs to be transparent up to 16 kilohertz. And you can either get data from me or from different manufacturers, or you can just test it yourself by playing pink noise mm -hmm. uh, in a speaker, put the fabric in front of the speaker, see if it changes a lot, and you can measure it if you have a, a test microphone and an analyzer. Sure. Um, here's a bunch of different absorbers, different sizes and shapes. There's all kinds of different styles. Uh, we have we have a line called Sonatus that you can get these absorbers in different colors and different thicknesses, uh, white, green, blue, gray, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. uh, we also make some absorbers that are uh, that are have a, a layer of wood in front of them to make them look pretty and actually filter off a little bit of the high frequency absorption because most rooms have already have too much high frequency absorption through the furniture, uh, carpeting and things like that. So tapering that down is a little bit of a good idea. And we got a whole bunch of different styles in the Sona to slide. You can look at that separately. All Those right. Those look cool. Those Thank little you. patterns and stuff look really yeah, cool. This, I really this like one's that. This really cool, called the maze. Yeah. Um, so uh, th these are tools that when you show them to a designer and an architect, then you go, oh, well, that's kind of, I yeah. can use this. I could see a few columns of this. Well, it um, goes from being this ugly thing that you don't want to something that actually looks really cool. Right. Yeah. So note on draperies. I, I work in rooms all the time where there's an entire window of glass mm -hmm. uh, or two windows of glass. And you go, oh, we're just going to cover that with a curtain. Uh, well, so there are a curtain is has a few problems one is it's going to absorb the whole wall which is too much right. second thing is it's an uneven absorber you don't really know what it's going to be every time it opens and closes it's going to be affected by the kind of fabric and the weight mm -hmm. of it and the pleat number uh, but you if you want it to be an absorber you need an air gap you need you need actually a little space between the curtain and the window otherwise the fabrics right up against the window is there's there's no absorption so right. um, my preference is a heavy velour type material um, and in what's called 100% fullness. So there's actually a fair amount of folding. And my preference is, is actually even better than that is if you can do a custom drape in which there's a back layer of blackout so that there's no light coming in. And, and then layered in that is strips of really thick flannel, which is called hmm. waffle bump in the business of making drapes. And then in front of that is a layer of acoustically transparent fabric to hide all of that. Now you have a drape that has strips of reflection, strips of absorption, it's mm -hmm. all curved around, so you get some scattering, and it doesn't suck out the quality of your room. Cool. Uh, so we, we do actually make that, my my group called Dimension 4 makes those curtains, they are expensive, it's a custom drape. Custom sure. drapes are expensive, but they do a great job of not sucking out the life of a room. Excellent. 
Um, okay. Um, low frequency gets interesting when you talk about absorbers. Regular frictional materials don't work very well because they need to be thicker and thicker and thicker. If you took, take that, uh, that little thing I had described in the, the low frequency, mm -hmm. as you go lower and lower and lower, it gets really thick. So you have to resort to different materials. And there's a bunch of approaches called tympanic resonators and cavity resonators and perfor perforated enclosures and spring-loaded enclosures. Uh, there's some active schemes. All of that stuff's really complicated. Um, and I, I would say that while frictional absorption is easy to understand, it scrubs off energy, the other stuff relies on pressure and resonances. Uh, you can buy materials from different manufacturers that are low frequency absorbers. This is stuff we make in the deco trap line that has all kinds of looks. Um, their main purpose is to not only control the reverb at low frequency, but also control standing waves, which is these resonances that get set up in the room from just the sound bouncing back and forth between mm -hmm. the front and back boundary and the left and right boundary. And those res resonances end up creating a bad frequency response, a really poor uh, impact because the sound resonates at certain frequencies and different bass at different seats. Mm -hmm. And the, the problems are usually not much higher than 150 hertz and down to 20 hertz if you have solid construction, if it's stud construction down to 30 or 35 hertz. Um, I did an entire two hour session on this called the, the subwoofer set webinar. Right. Go look at that. Yep. Okay? Yeah, we've talked ad nauseum about that. Um, but I, I do want to mention that Determining the right base absorber, if you're going to use resonating types, whether they're tympanic uh, or, you know, flectural tympanic or, or diaphragm, those are sort of synonyms, or resonance, gets really complicated. And you, you can't just measure at one point in space. You actually have to get an average mm -hmm. of measurements around certain places, four or five averages, uh, and look at all of that. And look at the decay of the, of the sound, understand if it's a resonance in the room or a reverb, and then act accordingly. Um, there are absorbers that work on pressure zones and others that work on frictional zones, and you have to understand all of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I get into discussions with, with the clients all the time or, or designers all the time. Well, I just put a diaphragm absorber over here. It's going to work. It's like, well, you can try. You can try it, yeah. If it's kind of like actually getting back to medicine. Sometimes the doctor gives you a, a remedy and it doesn't work because it was the yeah. wrong premise. And right. sometimes they don't know until you try that remedy and you go, well, that didn't work. I still have a really bad pain in my elbow. Then you do something else. Sure. Um, with medication, it's easy. You just change the vial. With acoustics, you just put all the stuff in your room and it's, it didn't work. Yeah. So I'm just saying be careful with all of that because you can you can easily go down the, the wrong road. Um, my preference around bass control is to have kind of broadband damped low frequency absorption mm -hmm. that covers the range, you know, from 30 hertz to about 150 hertz that's kind of distributed around the room to basically catch it all. Um, I've done rooms in which there's a whole bunch of different tympanic absorbers or, mm -hmm. or uh, resonator absorbers that are different frequencies, hoping that, hey, by, by basically doing a shotgun approach at doing a whole bunch of different ones, some of them will do some the right thing work. for that day. Sure, sure. Guys, as Anthony said before, we've we've covered a lot of the stuff about standing waves and bass. There, there's two that come to mind. We did one uh, webinar called Subwoofers is One Enough, I think was the title. And then the right. other one that we did that covered a lot of this was uh, in the speaker placement webinar. So right. again, those are all on YouTube, guys, on the AV Pro Edge YouTube channel. So feel free to, to rewatch those for, for really deep dive stuff. We, we went real crazy on a couple of those. It was a lot of fun. Right. Okay. Final little thing over here, scattering and diffusion. I've, I've also covered this in the webinar on, uh, all, on treatments. So right. uh, I'm not going to go too far into it, but scattering is the idea of instead of absorbing the sound, you actually preserve it in the room that you break it into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. um, it can be done uh, – oh, I'm sorry. It looks like this sort of gra graphically. I like to be as graphical as I can with these things. Mm -hmm. So the reflected path, rather than come back and bounce at you, is broken into small vectors. Um, there's a bunch of, of uh, ways to do that. Purpose-built materials, a bookcase with the books all at different depths can work, actually. You, you actually, if you calculate the resonances or the internal resonances of all of those little wells of, of quadratic residue, you can actually place the books in a way where somebody's going to come over and want to flatten them all back out. And like, oh, no. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, the main idea is to have enough scattering in the room to smooth out the sound field. Mm -hmm. They do have to be thick. 
a little scattering device that's only this thick is not going to do anything only at the highest frequencies and that's not where you get the benefit so right. it needs to be between 15 and 30 centimeters thick which is 6 to 12 inches that's big it's big yeah. uh, much thinner than that it just doesn't do enough and you want to sort of balance it i've said that before you want to interleave it so it makes the scattering and with the absorption um to me, scattering diffuser panels are, are the stuff that high-end rooms are made of. So if you go into a room and it's got really nice speakers, really nice amp, really nice nice um, uh, nice cabling and all of that stuff, and it only has a few panels of absorption in it, you should think, wow, we're not going to get to all of the potential of what this room right. can do. We right. really need to add some scattering devices in here. Um, I actually found a really, really interesting... Uh, paper was a review by old buddy of mine, also acoustical designer Keith Yates, from years and years and years and years ago, where he had gotten samples of the first RPG diffusers into his high-end shop when he ran one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and he obsessed and tweaked over all kinds of stuff, and he put those in. It was like, holy, this did more <laughs> to my, my sound than just anything I've done before. Um, he wrote an article, I forget in which which magazine. That's, that's like awesome. Keith, if you're listening, he's probably not. But if anybody has... I, <laughs> You know, whatever. It's a, it's a great article that you can show a client and go, look, this stuff is really important. It's real. Yeah, this is real. Look, real. here's a real world example. That's cool. Right. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different processes in scattering. Again, I've talked all about this before. Quadratic residue, maximum length sequence, primitive root, optimized hemispherical, complex mm -hmm. curves. Go look at this link and you'll be able to read all about it. They all have their pros and cons. Um, QRD slats rely on high velocity and they're frequency sensitive. Sometimes they have the side effect that if you put a lot of them in a room, you get sort of this little zippery sound because hmm. it's a repeat of all of the different scattering and it kind of uh. ends up sounding like zing if you don't place them correctly. Um, what's better is to scatter off uneven surfaces. Um, this is how a QRD diffuser works. If for any one well, the wave is actually going to resonate in there and right at the edge here where it bounces, I'm pointing at my screen as if you guys can actually see that. Um, this over here is where the sound's going to scatter back out with a random phase, which is why it's called RPG, random phase grading, and you get scattering. That's one, one methodology. Uh, those things can be quantified by looking at the diffusion and scattering coefficients. Um, Again, I don't have time to get into this. You can you can read this really uh, or download this measurement scheme uh, from the Audio Engineering Society if you really care about it. It's very very cool. Uh, here's some data on the venerable kind of er, er, early product made by RPG. This shows the diffusion character, the scattering character, and the absorption character of this box that is a QRD. Uh, quadratic it's based on a the math is bad based on a quadratic residue um, calculation in which there's a coefficient of dimension on there when it's when it's only one set of slats this way it's called a 1d when it's two of them it's called a 2d uh, there it is uh, now the same company has uh, evolved uh, rpg has evolved into doing this much more complex forms called bicubic uh, that have all kinds of you know a much smoother diffusion coefficient this is the character of these things, you notice they're a lot, lot smoother over frequency. And the, the newer diffusers are these kind of interesting curved shapes that yeah. bump around. And they look kind of random, but they're not. Actually, there's a real uh, thinking behind what these peaks and dips are all about. There's a theater here, local, that has those, and they almost look like clouds up in the ceiling. They're really cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, so by putting them up on the ceiling, you're taking the sound of of whatever's performing at the front and yeah. uh, letting it bloom up and then scatter really evenly around, which is really cool. This might be a, a kind of a complicated uh, answer to a simple question, but I always see that the treatments for the ceilings are all, always kind of suspended. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's a whole thing we could probably talk about about suspending them versus bolting them directly to the ceiling. Um, so I mentioned earlier about absorbers is that they work better by having an air gap. Yes. So take a yeah. two inch or three inch absorber and you drop it from the ceiling an inch or two or three, you get better low frequency performance out of Perfect. that. Perfect. On a diffuser, Perfect. it doesn't make any difference. Got uh, it. it. Sometimes it's it's style where you actually want to form this architectural cloud that has kind of something cool and you can put lights behind it, but it, there is no difference in the scattering character. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, cool. Um, I like to 
to lump diffusers into two core categories, and I'm using a different vernacular in that. There's a diffuser I call a 2D diffuser, not from the D and the quadratic residue equation, but in the D of dimensions, uh, in physical di dimension. And I call that a hemi-disc diffuser. That's one where the sound hits it and it gets scattered in a plane. Uh -huh. And that's that would be a diffuser with slats in this direction would do that. Um, and I like to use those generally towards the front of a room. So in this room, the you know front's behind me. You'll notice mm -hmm. that the these things over there are pointing, trying to point. Oh my God, it's all mm -hmm. mirrored. I can't do it. <laughs> it's like driving a boat. <laughs> uh, over there and, and over there. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, those are what I call 2D diffusers. They're not using a QRD approach. It's a different type of scattering scheme. I like to use those towards the front of the room so that the energy in the front of the room is all in the horizontal plane and you actually get better uh, sen sense of envelopment from that. Mm -hmm. And then I like to use what I call 3D, which is a hemispherical diffuser. I like to use those more towards the back of the room. I, I pointed the camera earlier. I'm not going to do that to you again. Mm -hmm. Towards the back and the ceiling, back of the ceiling of the room to help the surround speakers uh, scatter around the room and to get a better sense of energy about coming back to you from this direction. It kind of matches what really good sounding concert halls do. It, it actually does work. So uh, here's some simple diagrams of 2D diffusers, either cylindrical shapes or polycylindrical shapes that have a, a constantly varying radius. Slotted, uh, slotted diffusers, the sound that hits that is gonna get scattered only in the opposite direction, essentially, of where the ribs are. Uh, here's some 3D diffusers, uh, pyramid, uh, or these kind of skyline shapes. Uh, here's 2D diffusers, 3D diffusers, a um, bunch of different ways to do it. So uh, we make a series of different diffusers. This thing I'm really proud of is the this is called a C-fuser. Um, and it's actually a combination of a cylindrical diffuser and a base trap all in one. Wow. It's really well. We're using cool. the volume inside to, low, to do low frequency absorption. Uh, that, this is what's called a six strip, the Sonata six strip that's over there. Really mm -hmm. cool device. Uh, we have a four fuser. We have a big fuser. I love that term, big fuser. Big fuser, the big fuser, yeah. <laughs> uh, we make it in, uh, this is really cool. This is actually made in Croatia by a really, really good acoustical firm. Uh, oh, this cool. is actually a very low cost device made out of polystyrene that's coasted, uh, coasted, coated with, um, uh, with an acrylic paint, very mm -hmm. low cost. Uh, and then there's this one that's called Massive, uh, which is solid wood, weighs about 30 pounds, um, and really cool looking. All right, let's put all this together. Um, how many absorbers, how many diffusers do you use? Uh, I'm going to repeat this again. I think I said I was going to say it six or seven times. <laughs> yeah, I think You're not going to cover six, more though, than 15% yeah. of the walls with absorption. You're going to cover about 20% with diffusion, mm -hmm. 2D diffusion towards the front of the room, 3D diffusion towards the back of the room. You're going to spread the absorbers around the room evenly, spread the diffusers around evenly, and you're going to actually mount these slightly asymmetrically in the room for reasons I explained mm -hmm. ad nauseum in the other webinar. Th this um, would be – that slide, Anthony, that you just uh, – the, the one before, I'd be screenshotting that right now if I were a designer because this is yeah. such important information and all, all, all things that you have to remember. This is fundamental stuff right here. Really, really, really core basis. Right. Um, so um, – I also do want to mention this is not the only part of acoustics. The reason I talked about sound isolation and noise control is that's also a part. Ultimately, a really good room is one that's super quiet. You can crank mm -hmm. it up as loud as you want. Nothing vibrates, rattles, goes to any neighbors. You don't have to right. like worry. Am I waking somebody up? By, by the way, I didn't mention this, but a, a good reason to have sound ISO is to have the comfort to listen to as loud as you want without any anxiety. You can just relax yeah. and sure. know I'm not waking anybody, anybody up or bothering anybody. I think mm -hmm. that's important. That's um, part of the experience, right? Part of melting into the movie is not having right. to worry about these things. I, I love exactly. that. That's great. Exactly. You're in the movie. You're you're not mm -hmm. worrying. So good sound isolation, good noise control, and proper acoustic treatment, which I'm I'm about to conclude on this and let you guys go about your business. So um don't forget to treat the ceiling, primarily at the first reflection with absorption. And mm -hmm. remember that diffusion, which is not used enough in my view in, in cinemas or listening rooms, it smooths out the decay and makes the room sound really good. It, it it also enhances the quality of the absorbers, actually, so you can, as you put diffusers in, you can maybe knock down the amount of absorption you're using. Now, I'm going back to this diagram I used earlier, which is a top view of the room in which I'm showing where I would lay things out. Mm -hmm. um, I would put absorbers in that mid-reflection point between the speakers and the listener to get rid of that first bounce, and then diffusers around the back of the ceiling. And then I would put a diffuser at this first reflection off the speaker. Most people think you got to have an absorber there. It's like, no, no, a diffuser is fine. 
On the opposite side, I may put an absorber. Mm -hmm. and a diffuser on the opposite side I may put an absorber a diffuser an absorber a diffuser these are this shape I'm representing as a 2d diffuser you can see that this cylinder shape is going to scatter the sound out kind of evenly that way and then past a certain point of the, of the room I'm going to start to switch to these 3d diffusers that are scattering hemispherically in the room so here and on the back wall and then in the middle of the back wall, I like to put absorption. So let's let's mm -hmm. actually drill down into that. Uh, this is the left wall of the room, mm -hmm. right? So this is that that that's the first diffuser. If you go to the left, that's the first diffuser. This is our oh, this is our um, our meditating uh, yeah. neighbor in the earlier slide. We've convinced them that this stuff is cool, and now they've come into the listening room mm -hmm. to enjoy it with us. <laughs> um, and so this is a layout that I would that I would say to do. So so. Diffusers, absorbers, diffusers, absorbers. These are 3D diffusers. These are 2D. This is a surround speaker. This is our front speaker placed behind mm -hmm. an acoustically transparent screen. And in the corner, there's a base absorber. Now, this looks like a lot of coverage. This looks like, man, you've covered the whole wall. Yeah, but if I took everything off the wall and I just put all three of the absorbers in the corner, look at how much of this room I'm, I'm taking up. It's not much, yeah. Not much. It's about 15%. Yeah. So, it does, it does look like it takes up a lot of visual space because it's all sort of in the middle. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So this is a, a good layout for the left wall. This is a good layout for the right wall. Same kind of thing, absorber, diffuser, absorber, diffuser. I just mm -hmm. interleaved it. And it's actually offset from what was going on on the other side. Same thing if I took all these absorbers and stuck them in the bottom corner about 20% uh, only so Anthony there a question that came in from Dan he says where do you start the 3d diffusers if you have multiple rows of seating so in, yeah. in one row of seating it's right behind that guy so in multiple rows of seating would you start it behind the last seat or what do you think uh, no usually about halfway back halfway okay. to five eighths of the way back is a good place to start there's other factors in that including where your surround speakers where's the back listeners uh, that that's that's one that I could go on and on and on and on for but that's a, a good a good Kind of generalized uh, okay. recommendations have cool around. dan hopefully you got that dan if if, uh, if you want some follow-up just feel free to type into the question box there great okay um back wall <clears throat> absorbers in the middle of the back wall it's well known that if there's a lot of reflection hitting you from behind and coming back that's going to mono up your sense of space mm -hmm. it's, and that reflection could either be direct or actually through scattering diffusers uh, scattering diffusers are not very good on the orthogonal so if you have a center speaker passing your head hitting a diffuser right behind you and coming back here, it's gonna mono up the sound. So these rooms that have diffusers all the way around the back back, back wall, bad. No good, the yeah. The middle section needs to be absorptive. And then the outer section, you do 3D diffusers. And then the ceiling looks like this for absorption mm -hmm. and diffusion. Um, I've lost my absorbers. Anyway, there'd be absorbers here and diffusers, you know, sort of past the middle of the room. Now, um, Again, as a repeat, this is what the pattern of reflections and absorption are going to look like. You've already seen this earlier on. Mm -hmm. So some of the sounds that would bounce around get absorbed, some get scattered, some get reflected. I'm not showing this on here, but remember, there's still a lot of wall surface where the sound mm -hmm. can reflect freely. You just need the right balance of all of that. So this is a this is going to be a room that's going to produce a good sound field where the imaging is nice and tight, the sound space is nice and even, everything is going to be well tempered, and in the end the sensation oh there's my absorbers the mm. sensation is you get clear direct sound we've attenuated about 15 to 20 percent of the the reflected energy mm. so so we we're not so dominated by reflected en uh, sound and you get a smooth immersion. The impulse, if you put an impulse of sound in the room and looked at how it bounced around and returned back to the microphone or your ears, you'd get a direct sound and you get reflections, but they're all evenly spaced out in time. So that's the right way to go. Now, um, here's some renderings of how this thing lays out on the wall. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, getting less schematic and more into like some some pretty pictures. Uh, this is our Sonatus Cinema 350. Notice. Uh, these would be absorbers, mm -hmm. 2D diffusers, absorbers, 3D diffusers. Uh, this is our higher end, a higher end system. That's what's in the room where you got some absorbers, 2D diffusers, absorber, 3D diffusers, 3D diffusers on the ceiling. Um, didn't mean to do that. Uh, these are some schematics that show the full layout. You can see those on the Sonatus website uh, for first a 350 square foot room and there are 650 square foot room. So the bigger the room, the more absorbers, the more diffusers you're going to put in there mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to control the room. Always about 15% of the surfaces only. 
Um, so now um, this is a prettier rendering. Um, summary of all the stuff about reflections and diffusion is they degrade sound quality and sound staging. The treatments include absorption and diffusion. And how do you make this all look good? <laughs> so my favorite way to do it, we talked about this, is to, in a room like this, is to just do a design where you wrap fabric around the whole mm -hmm. room. Uh, that's what I'm showing over here. So this blue line would represent fabric everywhere. And the absorbers and diffusers are all hidden behind that. Uh, stretch fabric can be done many ways. This is an example of a company, this is a company called Wallmate, if I remember right. There's about six or seven different brands of these plastic clips that you can put on the wall, just a strip that you put from floor to ceiling at regular intervals, and the fabric gets tucked and clipped and stretched oh, in there. Nice. Very so cool. it's not it's not ridiculously overcomplicated or anything like that. It seems that it's, seems a fairly fairly easy solution, it's, right? It's pretty straightforward. Getting yeah. getting the stretch to be even to where the fabric doesn't yeah. get like little puckers in it is a matter of experience. And Jason, right. if you're going to try this, I, I guarantee the first wall is going to look horrible. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. The second wall is going to look less bad. By the uh -huh. time you're done with the whole room, you're going to go, wow, I guess I'm going to start all over and you're going to start over. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, yeah. of course. The way to do it, this is my, one of my favorite slides, is here's a room in which I'm showing some subwoofers, some diffusers, some absorbers. That mm -hmm. stuff has got to get hidden by fabric. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what the fabric is for. The fabric is not there to cover a half an inch or one inch of thin uh, polyester damping material. Uh, right. There's a lot of interior designers and architects who go, oh, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm going to put some padding on the wall. No, no, no. The Ooh. fabric is, if you just do that padding on the wall, it's basically going to only control the highest frequencies. It's not going to work right. right. What you have to do is to build out a skeletal structure, mm -hmm. typically four or six inches away from the wall, then put the strips and then hang the fabric on that and that that's the thing so if you have if you're working with any architects or designers that don't quite get what this is for please show them this part of the webinar okay mm -hmm. this is really cool this is the ugly crap that's hiding behind the fabric we close the hood on the car we no longer look at the engine mm -hmm. and this is what we get as a pretty car or in, in other words a pretty room nice. and this can look like this there's a room yeah. with black black walls and uh, actually the photography on this makes it looks look like the the woodwork is all yellow it's it's actually sort of a, it's a darker tone but that's just how ah. we got uh, photographed uh, here's another room um, so this is actually stretch fabric this is stretch fabric all of this stuff is hiding acoustical treatments behind mm -hmm. all of here this is another room, stretch fabric, stretch fabric. This is not a big screen TV. This is actually a projection set with a beautiful wood frame around it. This mm -hmm. is stretch fabric, stretch fabric. This is um, uh, printed fa acoustically transparent fabric uh, with these beautiful pictures of, of a woman jumping on a, tr on a trampoline. This is all hiding speakers and acoustical treatment. It's all, it's all acoustically porous. This is another room. All of these are different, but it's all stretch uh -huh. fabric. Uh, this is a room we did with the famous designer Theo Kalamirakis, mm -hmm. um, who's, yep, um, know him. you know him. Uh, mm -hmm. This is fabric on a curved structure. This is actually micro perforated metal. It's porous. Um, here's another room uh, with stretch fabric and some woodwork and some neat design. Here's another room. This I think a lot of these actually have won CD awards, by the way. Yeah, uh, sure, sure, sure. It's almost every one. I didn't pick them as that, but almost one of those are, are CD award winners. This one for Best Theater last year, this is Stretch Fabric. So this is Stretch Fabric from here to here. There's a little light cove below that that, that recesses the gap That's cool. behind there. There's light coming down. It's blue here. You can make it red, blue, green, whatever you want. This is another room with Stretch Fabric. There's nothing going on on the walls. Totally straightforward, easy stretch. What's going on is you, you may not like this, but... This is a, a fabric with a lot of visual structure to it. That's all mm -hmm. it took to decorate this room. Yeah, okay. it's nice. Simple. And this is a totally crazy room designed by Theo Kalamarakis also. It yeah. looks like it would be a complete acoustic nightmare. It's not. This is all fabric, fabric, uh, acoustic. This is all acoustically porous material behind which are speakers, uh, absorbers, treatments, and all of that. Um, so for more on this, like we said, go see the webinar on yeah. absorbers or diffusers. I will stop talking uh, about that. <laughs> so, I always like to end with the fact that you can read all you want about this. Here's a bunch mm -hmm. of great resources on all of these issues of acoustics. Um, I don't expect you guys can copy all those down here. Look at the uh, the YouTube channel. Here's uh, more good resources. Um, 
if you have to just go to one book because you don't you know you have other things to do in your life it's a pretty thick book great great uh, book written by dr floyd tool on all of the above um uh, take a look at that although this one is more about just sound reproduction doesn't go too much uh, into how to build uh, uh, wall structures that are sound isolated mm -hmm. i would say this is a good resource for that for um construction uh this is a good resource bunch of them anyway so uh i'm done two hours right at two hours that's good unbelievable <laughs> I, I and i do these i write these sessions so i can do it in an hour and then i start yakking you ask questions and I, it's listen, all my fault i the same when i do mine anthony and i'm doing the same things like this for video it's it ends up being the same thing i totally i totally yeah. feel you feel you on that yeah for yeah. sure for sure. So I do want to thank you guys for for sitting through two hours of this stuff. I hope this has been a good uh, good primer on acoustics. Um, yep. There's there's a lot more to the the depth of it than here. You, you, I hope this sort of guides your beginning of study into that that area. Mm -hmm. um, and if you need to reach me, here's my contact info. I would say that if you have a question that's not private, you know, something that you're willing to share with the audience, please uh, please send it to Jason. Yes. Um, through through the web through the website and uh, he'll forward that over to me and then everybody mm -hmm. can see the answer. Yeah, guys, and you can always reach me directly, Jason at avproglobal.com, and then we also have a kind of a generic uh, website or I'm sorry, email address for questions at info at avproedge.com. Feel free to uh, email us at any of those, and, and we're happy to get those questions answered for you. And and, th and it looks like those are your three uh, websites, yeah. That, that's my that's my propaganda. Uh, <laughs> so after years and years of doing this, I've developed some loudspeakers that mm -hmm. work well in rooms. We visit that we we have some engineering services for doing all this design work, and we have a, a package of acoustical materials that I've shown some some pictures of. You can you can see more info. Uh, there, there's also some webinar info on there. So yeah, all guys, right. we have uh, so this uh, audio expert series that we've been doing with Anthony since March, I think. Yeah, uh, yep. it's actually sadly coming to a conclusion. Uh, we have two sessions left. The next one is going to be on uh, sweet spots. How many sweet spots are are, are, are potentially in a room? Uh, so you can kind of direct people where to sit and, and design everything around that. And then our very last one that's going to tighten everything up and hopefully bring it all together will be on uh, EQing and calibrating audio. So two sessions left. Uh, all the sessions that we've done so far are on YouTube. So if you want to catch up or you want to uh, go back and revisit or review anything, feel free guys. Those are all uh, on the YouTube page now. And again, feel free to reach out with any questions. Great. Thank, cool. thank you guys for sitting through this. I again want to thank the people at AV Pro for putting this on. Again, they they uh, they do not commercially benefit from any of this. It's, it's a very altruistic uh, process. They're dedicating time, energy. Jason, I'm sure, could be doing other things than, than listening to me geek out about mm -hmm. sound transmission class. Um, and uh, so, you know, big, big, uh, big applause to those guys for really being good to the industry. Yeah, thank, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Anthony, for the kind words. Again, I could sit here and talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but we, I know you have a lot of stuff to do too. So uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that, guys, and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next week. And again, visit those uh, YouTube channels for, for the rest of the videos. Have a great All week, right. everybody. See you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.